A few days ago, I accidentally locked myself out of my house after having gone out for groceries. When I returned to my home and found the doors locked, I quickly googled and contacted a local locksmith. I had groceries which required freezing and a dog inside, two things which prevented me from shopping around for a reputable locksmith. I merely selected and dialed the first decent-looking one that I came across. I was given a reasonable quote over the phone and also a time at which to expect the locksmith. However, nearly two hours passed before he showed up. His truck was unmarked and presumably his personal vehicle, and his clothes were similarly plain. There was nothing to associate him with any service or company. He was nice enough, though, and even apologized for his lateness, although an explanation wasn't offered. He fiddled with the door for a moment, retrieved some tools, and went to work. A few minutes and a change of tools later, he opened the door. It was fairly hot outside, so I went in and grabbed the water bottle for him. He graciously thanked me, and then we began the payment process. I've been somewhat annoyed at his lateness, but the quickness of the actual unlocking of the door and his politeness had made my bad temper simmer down. But then he told me the job total, and I again became annoyed. It was well beyond the amount quoted over the phone, and having little time to waste, I accepted and confirmed the payment, then went inside. The total had been $200. I had had plans that day, so I put the incident in the back of my mind and went about my business. The following day, while relaxing and browsing stuff on the internet, I remembered the cost of the locksmith job, which had all but drained my wallet. I googled locksmith services in my area and even contacted a few of them and came to the conclusion that I had been ripped off considerably. The job had been during regular operating hours, the locksmith had been late, the method he'd used was amateur likely to cause damage to the door, a risk I was not forewarned about, and he warned nothing which identified his company. In hindsight, everything about the experience was unprofessional. Luckily, or so I thought at the time, the third-party payment service they used gave the option to dispute the charge in the link provided in the text receipt. I selected it, and after briefly explaining my situation, I was contacted by a customer service representative, but... Despite the option to dispute the charge, she couldn't actually facilitate a refund of my money, only tell me the information I already knew, that being the phone number of the locksmith service I'd used. Annoyed, but not deterred, I called the locksmith company and explained the situation, whilst politely but firmly demanding at least a partial refund. But not only did they deny me a refund, they said the rate was fair, because, and I quote, We got you inside, didn't we? I explained to them that they had ripped me off, provided them with quotes from other companies for the same job they'd performed, but they remained indignant. In a moment of frustration, I said that I wasn't afraid to take them to small claims court. And to this, the phone operator responded, You do what you gotta do. We'll do what we gotta do. Then hung up on me. I was too angered at the time to be unsettled, so I didn't really consider the parting statement to be a threat until later that night, when my frustration had dissipated with the arrival of nighttime, when I usually relax, watch TV, and reflect on the day. The man's words had become reinterpreted as a threat when I realized that I was dealing with someone who was probably unlicensed and unregistered, beyond Google ad posting, someone who by trade could enter a home soundlessly and with ease, I wouldn't say that I'm a coward or scared easily, but I do know when to be sensibly cautious. It was around 8 p.m. when this revelation came to me. I didn't have any weapons in my house, at least things intended for such a purpose, so I went to a neighbor's house, a trip that I hadn't ever taken since moving into the neighborhood some six years ago. Since we were essentially strangers, I tried my best to represent my situation in a way that would warrant his interest and support. I explained what happened, admittedly dramatizing the phone call to suggest the locksmith would be prowling around the area, rather than targeting my house specifically. I also emphasized the truth, that I had essentially been scammed by an unprofessional, something I think everybody can sympathize with. The neighbor is an old man, but not old enough to be totally unwelcome of strangers and their problems. He agreed that I should probably have some sort of greater protection in my home than some cooking and gardening tools even if the locksmith was just making empty threats. I was elated, and thought I'd soon be loaned a proper weapon of some sort, but after re-entering his house for several moments, he returned not with a weapon, 
but with a candle. He handed it to me and said, Before you sleep tonight, light the candle someplace near an exit of your home. Anyone. Doesn't matter. Make sure that you don't inhale the scent emitted, and rest assured that any trespassers on your property will be swiftly dealt with. You needn't worry about cleaning up or anything like that. All will be taken care of. He shut the door without further explanation, leaving me standing on his front porch holding a candle the size of a whiskey glass. I returned home and set the candle on the kitchen table. It was the first time I'd had any face-to-face -face interaction with a man, and despite his bizarre assistance, his behavior didn't appear to be that of someone who had succumbed to senality. But of course, I was not ready to be reliant upon a candle for my safety, so I packed up some tools and brought them with me upstairs and made sure the doors were firmly shut and locked, as if it mattered given the circumstances of my caution. I'd even briefly considered placing obstructions before the door, but found this to be a bit silly to perform. I'm not a superstitious person, and I wouldn't have even then said that the candle had any relation to superstitions or the supernatural, but I did go back downstairs and light it. Who knows, I thought. Maybe it'll deter intruders with some awful smell. Maybe that's why he told me not to inhale the scent. I followed the man's instructions and quickly left before the flames reached the topmost layer of wax. The following morning, I received a visit from the police. Apparently, a vehicle had been found down the street, only recently abandoned. Recently, as in the last few hours. One neighbor had noticed it while going out for her mail and knew at once that it didn't belong to anyone in the neighborhood. It was also parked too close to her house for her liking, so she called the police, who came not long after, to investigate. They ran the plates, identified its owner, and tried to contact them but had no luck in doing so. Another set of officers visited the address of the person to which the vehicle had been registered, but no one was home. The police then went around my neighborhood asking if anyone knew the vehicle's owner. As you might have guessed, the vehicle belonged to the locksmith who had unlocked my doors. While they explained the situation to me, I couldn't help but notice a lingering smell issuing from my kitchen. I hadn't yet made coffee, so the smell was unrivaled among the atmosphere of my home. I realized that it had come from a candle. Nothing else in my house smelled like this, and was surprised to find it fairly enjoyable, sweet, and pleasant. It took the officers shouting my name to pull me out of the mild reverie induced by the faint scent of the candle. Not wanting to incriminate myself and the disappearance, assuming he'd just wandered off somewhere, I told the police that I had no idea who the vehicle could have belonged to. They gave me weird looks, but accepted my proclaimed ignorance and moved on to the next house. Once my front door was shut, I nearly sprinted to my kitchen. On the table was the candle's glass holder, however, the wax had been almost fully reduced by the flame. Barely a stain was left. The candle was no longer lit, the wick bent and curled by the melted wax that had solidified around it. Only an echo of the candle's scent persisted, and yet it was incredibly powerful. Standing there in the kitchen, I actually lost time. I was totally bewitched by the smell. Over an hour later, after being shaken from my candle-induced intoxication by my phone's alarm, I went upstairs and began cleaning myself up. As I showered, I couldn't help but feel suddenly and powerfully terrifying. Even though the candle's olfactory enchantment had been almost sublime, something about losing myself so easily and totally unsettled me to my core. It was a feeling more intense than any drug, drink, or physical sensation I'd ever experienced. Once finished, I dressed and headed over to my neighbor's house, the one who had provided me with the candle. He answered promptly, undisturbed by my early visit. I greeted him and asked about the candle, telling him about the experience with it after it had burned itself out. He smiled, adjusted his sleeping gown, and said, almost in a whisper, burns deliciously intoxicatingly and could stop a man in his tracks with just one note of its scent. Could ensnare the hardiest of men and trap the most chaste. At its most potent, it is irresistible. All of the stimuli become a ghost, immaterial, invisible, unheeded. One could do anything to a man ensnared by the candle. As he had done last time, he closed the door on me before I could even think of a response. But before it closed, I saw through the dwindling opening 
a wall full of candles and paraphernalia of perfumery. And sealed within a lounge chair, unbound but clearly subdued by something, was a man who I recognized as the locksmith, an expression of deep relaxation upon his face. Everybody has that story to tell. The memory hangs out in the backseat of your mind, waiting for the right moment to chip in the group and share your childhood fear. The first time that you were scared, the first time you felt real fear, by the time you tell a story, you almost forgot it had ever happened. Maybe it was just a fever dream you had as a child. Maybe the circumstances were fabricated by your adolescent imagination, even though you doubt it ever happened. The memory still lingers, held dearer than what should have been your cherished moments when you were younger. When you think back, you don't remember the first time you tied your shoes or the first basketball hoop you made. You think of that story. It's there, waiting, almost as if it has unfinished business with you, like you're not allowed to move on from it yet. And You tell the story with a big smile on your face. The ones around you laughing so hard they ugly cry because your experience was so real and relatable. It could have happened to them just as easily as it happened to you. Once you've shared it, you feel better. And the memory retreats back to its den, hibernating until the stars align and it can torment you once more. I was at work when the opportunity presented itself. The night shift was over, and we were all in the locker room exchanging thick uniforms and heavy boots for Crocs and basketball shorts. Terry was telling a story about his fear of rats, his face a half grin as he struggled to get through it without laughing. I was on the bench, unlacing my boots. Dude, I've been looking for this fucking rat for a week. I would always see it out of the corner of my eye, the little bastard scurrying around while I was trying to sleep. Turns out it had made a nest in the box spring. I've been sleeping on it, dude, Terry says, shivering as he thought back. The other guys laughed, a cackling chorus of grown men amused by someone else's demise. I laughed as well. Terry was well known for his fear of rodents and was heckled about it constantly. They went back and forth over the details as I kicked off my boots. How do they deal with it? Do they burn the mattress? Did he let it sleep there forever? As the laughter dies down, I think of my story and wonder if I should tell it. At first I shiver at the thought, but before I know it, I'm grinning myself and dying to let it out. The old memory resurfaces like a shark from the deep. A story that happened 23 years ago. A story about a beaver. Alright, I got one. Terry, you'll especially like this. I say, standing up. The guys listen, still wiping the tears from the rat in Terry's mattress. It's been so long since I've thought of the beaver, and the details flood in as I picture it in my head. Alright, so this was a really long time ago when I was a kid. I think I was five or six. Anyway, I used to live in this trailer park over on Rainbow Road. That one over there by the highway? I vaguely point north as I close my locker. There's a few interjections before the story continues. Wait, Rainbow Road? Yeah, I know that place. My aunt used to live there. Used to live in the Cans, Jay? Over by 94? Yeah, a long time ago. Then ages, I say. And resume the story. Anyway, it was in the summer back in the 90s. And we were all playing outside. Not shit to do. There was nothing but trailers and a long line of mailboxes. We were all poor and there was no playground to play at, so most of the time all the kids would just group up and we would walk around and play with rocks and shit. We'd walk around all day and our parents didn't care as long as we didn't go by the highway. They were always worried about a car hitting us, I say, and in my mind I can hear the sounds of cars passing by. So there's like five of us playing by this trailer that didn't have anyone living in it, and all of a sudden one of the kids just freezes and says, uh... What's that? So we all look, and sitting on the porch of the trailer is this big fucking beaver, just staring at us, I say. 
the beaver's black eyes and teeth clear in my mind. I shudder at the thought of it. The guys laugh and Terry visibly cringes. So we're all frozen there, all of us, too scared to move. We'd never seen one before. We're all terrified at this beaver. And it's just staring us down. We're just waiting for it to rush us, like it was going to eat our bones or something. Really scary shit. Anyway, so there's this girl standing next to me. I think her name was Kirsten. Uh, she whispers to me and says, go get your mom. We'll stay here. My house was the closest, only two trailers away. So I run home thinking this beaver is going to chase me like it's some kind of horror movie or something. And I run and I tell my mom and she starts yelling about us playing by the highway. And the whole time I'm just scared shitless. This beaver is going to eat my friends by the time we go back. No shit. What happened? Did it attack you guys? One of the guys says. And I laugh. No, my mom grabbed the broom. We went back and she pretty much just shoot it off. But I still can't shake the look that beaver gave us. We, we really thought it was going to eat us. Like, fucking hate beavers, dude. I finished the story and they all laughed. All except Terry, who looks like he found something new to add to his list of rodent fears. I chuckled to myself at the thought of the memory, feeling a bit of the weight lift from my mind, like a shred of the trauma is healed. After some brief shit-talking, we all punch out and leave the building, everyone walking to their cars with their heads held high. Now that the day's work is done, I wave goodbye and get in my car. As I watch the other guys pull away and drive off, I find myself sitting there in silence, pondering the story I told. I think of the beaver story with its nasty buck teeth and black eyes. I think of how funny it is looking back and I hear the laughter of the guys in my head. The longer I think about it, the more the laughter fades away and the more I hear screams instead. I think of the story, suddenly feeling guilty, wondering why I said it in the first place. Maybe after all this time, I'm just trying to make myself feel better. In my head, the memory unravels. I think of the story and how it's a lie. There's no beaver. There never was. I lean my head on the steering wheel. I hadn't thought of it in so long, I was sure that I could leave it in the past. I hear the screams. My own screams and those of the other children. I think of the unexplainable memory pushed so far back in my mind. Kirsten was my first crush. I remember her freckled face and short hair and a little red ball cap she would always wear. Everyone thought she looked like a boy, but I thought she was pretty, even though I really didn't know the meaning of the word. She lived across the park in a yellow trailer and would always come over to play when all the kids got together. There were five of us and only a few of us had bikes, so if we all wanted to play together, we would usually walk around and play with sticks and stuff like that. Sometimes we'd play tag or red rover, but that day we found ourselves just walking around bored. The trailer park was an oval formation. The mobile homes placed in a loop with a circular road in the middle. It was surrounded by trees except for the side I lived on that was tucked into a hill that the highway was built on. It was nice outside that day, and our parents booted all of us out of the house so we would enjoy the nice weather, and so they could have some peace and quiet. They only had two rules, don't talk to strangers, and don't go near the highway. The park wasn't fenced off or anything, and you could hear cars and trucks flying past all day long. We were walking the road in a little group and doing laps without any real plan. We continued like this for a while, every time passing each other's houses and telling jokes, sometimes nagging our parents if we could come in yet. Two trailers down from mine was the only vacant lot in the park. Nobody lived there as far as we knew. The driveway was always empty, with a concrete slab in place of a trailer. The backyard consisted of an uphill climb through the trees that led straight to the highway. It was silly, but between the emptiness of the vacant trailer and the sounds of the highway, it felt like that specific lot was separate from the rest of the park. I don't know if it was the shade from the overgrown trees, the layer of old pine needles on the ground, or the dead sticks scattered about the unkempt yard. There was always something about it. 
like it was in its own little bubble. And that was when the dares started. On that particular boring day, one of the kids had the idea that for every lap we took around the park, one of us would have to step foot on the lot. The mini barren zone always gave us the willies, and the thought of pushing the boundaries of the scary property gave us all a shot of rebellious adrenaline. At first I thought it was scary, and I was worried about getting in trouble. But when I saw Kirsten perk up giddily, I decided to play along so I could impress her. Whatever I could do to seem cool and make her smile. It felt like we were doing something bad, and the excitement of who would go the furthest would hurry us along as we walked each lap around the park. We would take turns. Each lap, one of us would walk into the driveway. The next would go up and touch one of the sticks, etc., etc. I remember on one of my turns, I crept into the yard behind the little driveway and sprinted back, comically yelling like something was chasing me all the way back to the road. Looking back, it was immature but it felt like the unexplainable gloom was always trying to nip at your heels. Hours passed as we repeated the cycle. A lap around the park, then one of us running in. There towards the end, we were jogging around the park, all of us excited to take our next turn. As time went on, kids would get called to come back home, and the group began to dwindle. We started to push faster, each of us paranoid to be the next kid to be walking away from the fun with our head hung low as the others laughed. Before we knew it, almost everyone had gone home. Everyone except Kirsten and I. I remember it being my turn next, and the both of us running back to do one more stunt. The sun was starting to set, and we knew any minute our parents would call us. I remember running alongside her, sweating and gasping for breath as the laps tired our legs. Kirsten huffed and laughed as she ran, holding the bill of her ball cap so it wouldn't fly off. This one would be the craziest, I thought. It was my chance to really impress her. I would go into the woods this time, maybe even close to the highway. When we came to the driveway, however, we both stopped. Our smiles faded, and the sun seemed to fizzle away in an instant. There was an old rundown trailer on the vacant lot like it had appeared out of thin air. The dingy green paint was peeling, and the porch looked like it was about to collapse. The drapes in the windows were nicotine-stained and ratty, barely concealing the complete darkness within. As I watched, the front door creaked open slightly. From the darkness within, a groaning whisper escaped. No lights on inside, no car in the driveway. What the? I looked at Kirsten for validation, but she wasn't even looking at the trailer. She was looking at a woman in the yard. It was then I noticed her, off towards the trees. She was standing with her back turned, and even though we couldn't see her face, we knew something was horribly wrong. Once white clothes were heavily stained and ripped up, fitting awkwardly on her frame. One of her legs was bent backwards, and one of her arms was missing, a heavy drizzle of blood oozing from the stump. Despite how mangled she was, she stood perfectly still. We just stood there for a time, both of us silently gawking at her. The air was chilly, like a temperature drop before a bad storm. Kirsten looked at me, the color drained from her face. Without a word, both of us looked in the direction of our homes to see which one was closest to run to. When we looked back in the direction of the woman, we noticed she had silently moved closer. Her back was still turned, but we could see the damage. Clearer, horribly road-rashed muscle, black streaks on her clothing from the combination of tires and asphalt. What do we do? Kirsten whispered. Her voice a whimper. I... I don't know, I managed, my bladder suddenly feeling like it was going to burst. I remember my legs shaking. Maybe we could... Ahead of us, the woman turned. Not in a normal sense, but like she blinked to facing a different direction. Like someone had flipped the paper over while our eyes were closed. The sight of her face provoked a gasp from both of us. I was crying now. Filled with the confused fear you have when you wake up from a terrible nightmare. The woman was missing her bottom jaw. And with it, half of her upper face. The only identifiable thing left of her top jaw was... 
a hanging bloody tongue, and her two front teeth. A single eye looked at me angrily, the pupil surrounded by the black splotching of burst blood vessels. No sound emitted from the woman, but seeing the way she stood there, frozen in place, I couldn't explain it. Something was just wrong. Horribly wrong. Your house is closer. Run, get your mom, Kirsten whispered, her voice trembling. Her breath came out as fog. The mangled woman remained in place, but her single eye was locked on Kirsten now. Before our eyes, she blinked forward, three feet closer in Kirsten's direction. I wanted to reach for her hand, but it seemed so far away. I looked at her freckled face, tears streaming down them as she stood as still as possible. But, but I whimpered, and the mangled woman blinked again, a few more feet, facing my direction. Without a single sound, the eye glared angrily at me. I sobbed as she grew closer once more, her eye dilated in response to my noise, and at her side... Her only remaining hand twitched. Just go! Kirsten's shout echoed across the park, rustling birds from the trees. I turned and ran. My shoes skipping down the sidewalk. I couldn't breathe. I looked over my shoulder at the terrified look on Kirsten's face and the woman shifting closer, burning itself into my memory. Even as she drew closer to her, Kirsten kept her eyes on me, weeping silently as she watched me go as she made sure I could get away. My house was only a few trailers away, but I felt like I was running across town. My legs were weak, my thoughts raced. The further I got from the yard, the warmer it seemed to get. The sun began to feel hot, but my blood was still cold. I tried to focus on the patio door to my home where my mom would be inside, where I could get her to save us. The adrenaline crawled across me like ice, and I thought just for a moment that everything was going to be okay. It was all just a nightmare. My mom would show up and fix things just like she did all the other times I had a problem. By the time I made it to my yard, Kirsten screamed. The shrill cry of terror and pain made me stumble, and I fell to the ground. I looked behind me frantically, but Kirsten and the woman were gone. All I could see was an empty yard, and I started shaking. I looked to my front door, then back to where I left Kirsten. I didn't know what to do. I thought it would take too much time to get my mom. I shook and sobbed on the ground as my adolescent brain tried to compute the right thing to do. I just wanted to help. I wanted her to be okay. In my fear, I wet myself. Behind me, Kirsten screamed again. She was getting further away. I got back on my feet and I ran back to the phantom trailer, cursing myself for leaving her alone. We should have just ran together. Why didn't we just run together? No, 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 I sobbed, my stomach desperately wanting to purge its contents. My legs begged me to stop, but I pushed them forward. My sneakers scuffed the sidewalk as the hot trail of urine ran down my leg. I ran past the neighbor's lot and around the corner of the trailer that shouldn't exist. When I got to the yard, I couldn't see either of them. The same awful chill returned, and a mist was working its way across the yard. My eyes followed the source. A ghostly fog that was cascading down the porch steps. It was spilling from the trailer. The tiny crack of the door and the darkness inside. The doorway groaned as the fog billowed out, widening slightly with a creak. The window started to bleed, and the shutters shriveled like burning plastic. The worst thing of all... Was what I saw in the trees. The woman was dragging Kirsten by her arm, painfully whipping her around each time she blinked up the tree, dragging her towards the highway. I screamed for her to stop. The mangled woman paused only for a moment, her destroyed mouth reverberating with what I could only describe as a snarl. Kirsten howled in pain as she clawed at the woman, the bruising grip worsening as her helpless hands passed through a seemingly ethereal body. Unnatural and horrible, the mangled woman ascended the hill, each freeze-frame blink bringing them closer to the roaring traffic. I ran after them. I made it halfway across the yard before my foot caught something, sending me face-first into the foggy ground. My palm slapped the ground, softening the fall on something rough and sharp. I tried to get up, but something grabbed my ankle. 
winding tight like rope as I tried to shake it free. Kirsten's screams got weaker the further she got from me. The fog dispersed as I thrashed to be free, and though I saw no grass at all, the canvas of pine needles and leaves was replaced by hundreds, thousands of dead birds. I looked behind me and shouted for help, hoping to see my mom or one of the neighbors rushing to help. I saw nothing but an empty street and twisting vines wrapping around my ankles. When I turned back to the hill, Kirsten was holding onto a tree, trying to resist the mangled woman's grip. Her fingers clung to the bark and her sneakers formed jagged ruts in the earth. This slowed the woman for a moment, but she retaliated by breaking Kirsten's wrist. The wet snap followed by the worst sound I'd ever heard. I wanted to say I broke free. Sometimes when I dream, I break free from the vines. And I make it through the fog. Other times, grown-ups show up and everything's okay. Sometimes Kirsten has the strength to free herself. and We get away together and sometimes there's no mangled woman at all. It's only a beaver. In reality, the true ending can never be denied. The version where my scream only joins hers. Scream as I reach helplessly and the mangled woman makes it to the road. I watch as the truck takes them. An impact so forceful and sudden, they simply blink away, leaving nothing but streaks on the highway and a hat in the wind that match the color. The fog recedes into the trailer like a movie being rewound. The blood seeps back into the glass and the curtains unshrivel. The warmth returns and the parents flock outside, mortified and speechless as they press me for answers. In time, my screaming fades, replaced by the howling of sirens in the distance. I look up from the steering wheel and dry my tears. The parking lot is empty and everyone else has left for work except me. I think of the images in my head, the weeping eyes I can't unsee, cries I can't seem to forget. When I start my car and shift out of park, I think about the years that have passed by. I think of how I never really spoke to my friends again after that day and how everyone seemed to chalk it up to two kids who were never supposed to play by the highway. The park seemed to fall apart after that. Kirsten's parents moving first with my family to follow. I heard some sort of mass exodus followed. A tiny little poor park reduced to nothing but a memory to the nearby bars of traveling truckers. Another traffic accident. Another poor child lost. Tonight, instead of taking my usual route, I took a detour. I take the expressway until I see a road. One so ignored and unkempt you wouldn't know it was there if it wasn't for the reflecting green sign. A sign faded and almost illegible with age. A sign that reads, Rainbow Road. I turn onto the winding path, one that feels more like the entrance to a cemetery than a back road. My car rolls over broken pavement and traverses potholes until I see something in the distance. The only landmark in the otherwise empty place that's been consumed by weeds and hoof growth. As I approach the line of old, rusted mailboxes, I slow down. Ahead is the concrete circle. But there's no homes. Only a loop that's been slowly swallowed by the forest surrounding it. My headlights cut through the unnatural dark, the special kind that engulfs in the middle of nowhere. I think of a hot summer's day and a bunch of bored kids with nothing to do. Letting my car idly crawl, I pull into the loop and survey my surroundings. On Rainbow Road, there are no mobile units to be seen. Each passing slab of the empty lot looks like a gravestone, a gritty reminder of young little lives that will be forever changed. I pass by Kirsten's old lot, think of her freckled face, 
the way she laughed, and the way she would roll her eyes when I made stupid jokes. I passed by the old lots of my friends' houses and wondered where they're at in the world. I passed by the lot where my home used to be, and I think of my mother. A time before the therapy I went through. A time before she started talking less and less. Driving past the old vacant lot, I see no mangled woman and no green trailer. Only the light of cars flying by the highway on the hill beyond. I look at this one longer, expecting to see something more, something of meaning. I look over the weathered surface of its foundation, years of rain slowly chipping away at the concrete. The grass that's overtaken the driveway, the thin layer of gravel reclaimed by earth. I stare into the trees, I look at every wicked branch in the night, I search for those twisted limbs and malformed face and wonder if it's hiding somewhere in there. I listen for the screams and find cicadas instead. Nothing but empty lots, overgrown grass and fleeting rodents. When I reach the end of the circle, I see the exit and stop. I see the winding road and how it's been so long since I've been here. How I'll have no reason to come back. I let off the brake and I keep turning left, going over the same vacant spaces again. But this time, I think of the good times. I think of every dare that didn't end in tragedy. I think of every boring summer day where we climbed trees or played tag. I think of every smile Kirsten made and how, how it would give me butterflies in my stomach. When I reach the end of the circle, I decide to go again. My head filled with laughter and smiles. The kind no longer thought by a late twenties man. And that one's through, it leads to another. And another. Each passing tree and remembered backyard spawning memories long buried under the surface and lost long gone. Memories deserving remembrance. I kept on the loop for a while, holding the same angle on the wheel as I drove in a circle into the late hours of the night. I thought of many memories, reliving them like they were yesterday. Until something changed. A flashing strobe was blinding and unexpected, and part of me wondered how I didn't even see it coming in the first place. The squad car may have followed me with his lights off for a while, and I was none the wiser. I pulled my car over right in front of where my old house used to be. Putting it in park, I sighed as he ran my plates. The cop took their time, both of our engines running idly in the middle of nowhere. When they finally emerged from their car, I had my license and registration ready. I rolled down the window in time to see an old officer, headlights illuminating a mustached face, white with age. When I offered my paperwork, he waved it off with a question. What are you doing out here this time of night, kid? Getting high, getting drunk? He asked impatiently as he looked inside my car. No, just um, visiting an old friend, I guess, I said. And he blinked at me. Very funny. You know how many times I get called out here? Look, you kids come out here screwing around, shooting up, causing trouble. There's no reason for it. I thought maybe after they set fire to the last trailer out of here, we leveled it with the bulldozer. And that'd be the end of it. Now you're here driving circles until dispatch picks it up. There ain't nothing out here, kid. Either you're lying or you got the wrong address, he said sternly, his frown curving his mustache. She passed away a long time ago. She was, um, she was hit by a truck on the highway, I said. And there was an immediate sadness in his eyes. Mm, sorry to hear that, he said, and collected himself. That was a long time ago, but I remember it clearly. I was first on the scene. Terrible, terrible thing. My family bought flowers out of here for years. And after everyone moved away, they were the last people who came by and that weren't trying to cause trouble. After a while, they stopped coming. Now this place is just an overgrown hole. I thought of the family visiting each year. I thought of long wilted flowers deeply saddening me. I looked around the park as the officer collected himself, looking over empty lots until my eyes rested on that particular one two doors down from mine. I felt the icy chill crawl over me again, but the officer's voice pulled me away. You, you're that boy, 
Never thought I'd see you again, let alone recognize you. Yeah, I haven't been here since it happened. Felt like I'd stopped by, I said, peering through the light at him. Oh, I'm sorry I gave you such a rough time. I'm sorry about your friend. People like to come out here and cause trouble. Park's never the same after that, and once everyone moved out, it's been a hot spot for squatters, and I like for a while. It's private property. The owner calls and raises hell every time he sees people out here. I understand you're paying your respects, but I don't have to ask you to leave. I'll follow you out, he said, starting to leave. Without much to say, I just nodded and rolled up my window. The officer started walking away, and I watched his silhouette shrink in the side mirror as he made his way to his car. When he reached the door, he stopped, his hand pausing as he reached for the handle. After a moment, he turned around and he started walking back. I waited for the mustache face to come into view and rolled the window down again. Hey, kid, he asked, his brow furrowing a little. Yeah, I said, the air feeling chillier, a light fog rolling over the road. The sight of it made me sick to my stomach. Back then, when the accident happened and I arrived on the scene, you kept saying the same things over and over. Green trailer, lady in the woods, he said, leaning on the door. I remember, I said, but I'm not looking at him anymore. My eyes are held ahead. Are you sure that's what you saw? Are you sure that's what happened? He asked. I could feel him study my face. I'm positive, I, no doubt in my mind. Why? I asked, looking to the side of the road, to the darkness beyond the headlights. Oh, when we arrived, there was no trailer. No woman in the woods, either. I asked every resident in the park. Nobody saw anything. We searched for miles, thinking maybe you were right. Someone had fled the scene. Even got a helicopter. Did you find anyone? I said, gripping the steering wheel. Nobody. Ah. In the dark, I traced the faint outline of something ahead. Rectangular in shape. Yeah, but here's the thing. After talking to all the neighbors, we spoke to the landlord. When we mentioned what you said you saw, he turned white, almost fainted, that it was impossible. Said he'd been running the park for over 20 years, and all that time there'd only been one green trailer in the 80s, he said, and paused to chew his lip. A young couple used to live there, pretty young woman, drunk for a husband. Whenever he wasn't sunk in a bottle, he was getting into drugs. Anyway, always late with rent, always yelling and screaming at each other. He said sometimes when they fought, he'd beat her up pretty bad. She'd walk around the loop, waiting for her husband to calm down or fall asleep. He said she'd ask for help from the neighbors, knocking on doors as she went. They helped at first, but it happened a lot, he said. She would always go back home. They'd make up. Things be quiet for a while. It'd always get bad again. You know, back then it was a different time. The police didn't do much to help her, I'm afraid. After a while, they stopped taking her calls. Not long after that, the neighbors stopped helping altogether. Just a thing that happened. The fog started to get thicker, but the officer didn't seem to notice. One night, after an especially bad fight... He beat her up real bad, and he left. Took the car, left her there. Landlord said she came out eventually, limping, her face all swollen, mumbling his name as she walked the loop in the middle of the night, waiting for him to come back, I guess, but he never did. She kept walking, even after everyone put their lights out for the night. When the morning came, she was gone. Through the fog, I could see the outline of windows in the rectangular shape and the dark structure of a porch. The police found her on the highway, hit and run. Nobody knows if it was grief taking hold or if she was just trying to catch a ride in a town. Anyway, pulled the trailer from the lot and never put another one on it. Never allowed another green one either. I thought of Kirsten's scream and the floating baseball cap. Oh, look, kid. I don't know what you saw that day, but I'm sorry. About the whole thing, I'm sorry you lost your friend. The officer said, patted his hand on the hood awkwardly. Do you see it now? 
I asked, pointing forward. The officer raised his eyebrows and looked into the distance. I watched as his face softened with worry and his eyes narrowed on what lay ahead. Without a word, he grabbed his flashlight and aimed it in the yard. With a faint click, the beam cut through the dark and he panned it slowly around the property. I watched it shine over the fog and watched it shine on a familiar dingy green paint. Ratty stained drapes and a mangled figure at the end of the yard. I don't see anything, kid, he said, and shut off his flashlight. I looked into the darkness, transfixed on what I knew was still standing there. Me neither. Sorry for causing trouble. You have a good night, officer, I said, and started rolling up my window. He looked like he wanted to stop me, but in the end he stood there and let me go. I drove past the empty lot and rusting mailboxes, keeping my eyes forward until I was through the winding road that led out the park. I didn't realize I was holding my breath until I was turning back onto the main road. Once I was out, the icy feeling withered away and I was welcomed back by the comfort of green traffic lights. As I left the park behind me, I released my grip on the wheel and I felt the tension in my shoulders melt away. I sighed exhaustedly, keeping my foot on the gas until I made it to the clover leaf that led me here. I took the ramp quickly, knowing the highway would overlook the park and ultimately take me home. I didn't know why I took that way, whether it was just me being defiant, or maybe I just felt like I had to, or, or maybe inside the safety of my car I thought I'd be all right. Merging onto the highway, I sped onto the overlook and could see the empty park in its wooded sanctuary. Below, I could see the slow-moving headlights of the officer leaving. The fog and the trailer were gone, and with it, the mangled woman. I returned my eyes to the road, just in time to see a hitchhiker walking on the shoulder. They walked slowly, leisurely, kicking rocks as they went. As I approached, they stopped and looked at me, slowly waving as I rapidly approached. It was a little girl with a freckled face and a red ball cap. When I checked the rearview mirror, she was gone. For context, I'm a middle-aged man who lives on the outskirts of Parvlin a small English village. My house is the only one on a long, winding country road, but it does have a bus stop. From my bedroom window, I can see it on the other side of the road. It's quite handy, really. I never really miss the morning bus to work. I know the schedule off by heart. That's why I was bewildered when I first noticed the 3.17 a.m. bus on Saturday, the 14th of October. It woke me up, actually. I'm a light sleeper. I sat upright in my bed. I twisted my body around, propped myself up on my knees, and gingerly inched the curtains open. The old lamp post on my road illuminated an ominous, fully gray, non-branded, single-decker bus. There was no interior lighting. I couldn't see a driver or any passengers. Now, this was obviously bizarre. Buses don't show up at that time in the morning. Not in this country. Not in any town or city that I know, anyway. Still, I assumed, as any person would, that times were changing. It seemed like a good idea. A bus for those who've missed the last train home after a night out, perhaps. That, that still didn't exactly make sense, because very few people use my bus stop. It's a ten-minute walk from here to anywhere. I checked the schedule. Nothing. There was a bus at 11 p.m. on Friday evening, and there shouldn't have been another one until 6.05 a.m. on Saturday morning. I watched the vehicle pull away and considered, perhaps, that it wasn't a public bus. Maybe it was a hired coach. Seemed like a reasonable explanation. I put it out of my mind, and I went back to sleep. However, it returned the next morning, and it continued to do so for weeks. Again, I, I checked the schedule. Still no mention of a 3.17 a.m. bus. I called the council. They assured me that it wasn't a public bus. They said it... They said I could contact the local authorities to report any suspicious activity, so I rang the police. 
they didn't care. They passed me over to some civil department with a forgettable name, and that department passed me over to another department. Nobody was concerned. It became clear that each person I contacted just wanted me to tire of the whole thing and stop bothering them. I gave up on seeking help, but I didn't give up on my quest for an answer. I started making notes. The bus always arrived exactly at 3.17 a.m. It would linger for approximately 30 seconds. Nobody ever boarded or departed the vehicle. I took a picture of it and posted it on various forums. Nobody could identify the origin of the faceless gray bus. But one comment did stand out. I remember a user telling me that I should sell my house and move. They said the bus was there for me. More importantly, that I shouldn't, under any circumstances, board it. Now, that seemed like a rather obvious piece of advice. I wasn't planning on boarding a sketchy, unlisted bus in a pitch-black hour of the morning. But everything changed on November 20th. The bus arrived on time, 3.17 a.m. I knelt on my bed and peeked at it through the curtains as it rounded the corner. Something... something was different. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Once the vehicle had rolled to a complete stop, I, I heard it. Somebody on the bus was screaming. I froze. I didn't know what to do. Silence followed, but I knew I hadn't imagined it. I knew I'd heard that scream. I, I watched the bus and I waited. Thirty seconds passed. A lot of time passed. When I finally peeled my eyes from the road to check my phone, it was 3.29 a.m. The bus hadn't moved. The world outside was still eerily quiet. I reattached myself to reality and started dialing 911. The call kept failing, and then I saw that I had no signal. None. I usually had signal at the house. <laughs> I was freaking out, so I got up to turn on my bedroom light. Nothing. I flicked the switch back and forth. No power. The story was the same throughout the house. I was about to head to the fuse box, but I looked out my living room window to see a blackened world. The lamppost was dead. It had to be a power cut. That was when I finally understood, for the first time in my ten years of solitary living, that I was truly isolated. I, mean, I had no neighbors, no friends, no family. I, I was alone. The gravity of the situation dawned on me. I, I'd have to leave the house. My self-preservation instinct was to stay indoors, but I couldn't ignore the disembodied scream that had echoed through the night. I knew it had come from the bus. I knew I couldn't live with myself if I were to just dismiss it. Armed with a winter coat and a wind-up torch, I bravely ventured into the night, locking my door behind me. I tentatively strolled down my front path, stopping at the gate to cast the iron torch to the other side of the road. It revealed the gray, stationary, seemingly abandoned bus. There were no signs of life. Everything was so quiet. I swore to myself that I could hear my heartbeat in my eardrums. I swung the creaky gate open and began to cross the road, futilely attempting to steady my quaking knees. My torch wobbled in my shaky left hand, so I clasped my wrist with my right hand. I shone the light into the windows of the parked vehicle. There was definitely no driver, but it was an elevated coach. I, mean, I, I couldn't see whether there were any passengers. I walked around the front of the vehicle, summoning the courage to enter it, and when I reached the other side of the bus, I stood still. I tried to control my breathing. I, I eyed the doors for what seemed an eternity, and then I felt my entire body clench. The doors opened. The torch still wasn't revealing a driver. I, I couldn't see or hear anyone. I thought for a brief moment of that internet stranger, the one who told me not to board the bus, but I, I couldn't get the scream out of my head. My gut told me that somebody was in danger. I stepped onto the bus and started to climb the stairs. The doors closed. I held the torch before me, as if it were a weapon. I gradually climbed the next set of stairs to the elevated passenger platform. I spent several seconds on each step savoring what I felt could be my final moments on Earth, and then, then I illuminated the passenger area before me. 
and I was expecting to see nothing. No, there, there was somebody on the bus. The young girl was sitting on the middle seat of the back row. Her head was in her palms. She was crying. I, I couldn't see her face. Are you okay? I asked timidly. No answer. So I started to walk forwards. I didn't know whether there was anyone else on board, but I couldn't leave her. Once I was standing only a few yards in front of her, I knelt down in the aisle. Are you okay? I asked a second time. The girl's crying abruptly ceased, but she didn't lift her head from her hands. You shouldn't have boarded the bus, she replied. My torch died. I furiously wound the lever at the side, but it didn't spring back to life. The girl and I had been plunged into darkness, and then I heard the bus doors open. I slowly turned my head to the front of the bus. I, I could hear the sound of low, guttural breathing. It was followed by clunking footsteps. Dim moonlight shone through the front window, but it was sufficient to display a hulking figure at the other end of the aisle. A black specter with gangly limbs was moving towards us. He was hunched forwards and his elongated arms dragged along the tops of the seats. He was tall, too tall, too wide to fit in the aisle. I turned to face the girl. She had lifted her head from her hands. I, I could barely see her. I could barely hear her. This was the last stop, she whispered. I was really hoping he wouldn't board. I wanted more time. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, I felt an icy limb coil itself around my ankle. I was yanked and I fell, my nose connecting with the floor of the aisle, and I heard something crack. I thought that was it. I thought that was the end, but I looked up to see the demonic creature coil its other limb around the girl's neck. It hoisted her from her seat. She screamed as she was lifted towards the indistinguishable figure in the aisle. I couldn't really see what happened in the darkness, but... But I'll never forget the sound her body made when it was consumed by the black entity. It sounded like leaves crunching beneath walking boots. I had almost entirely lost my sense of reality at this point, but some vestige of survival instinct persisted in my fractured mind. I, I twisted into my back and I looked down at my ankle. I, I couldn't really see what I was doing in the dark. I just knew that I had to act. So with my free foot, I stamped at the creature's limbs. I stamped as hard as humanly possible. The demon which had been devouring the poor girl unleashed an inhuman wail. It, it pierced my eardrums and shattered every window on the bus. The limb retracted from my ankle and returned to the shadowy being. I seized my opportunity, catapulting to my feet. I spun around and lunged for the now glassless back window of the bus, clinging to the frame of the window for dear life. I took one last look at the dark entity that was hurtling towards me and then <laughs> I dropped to my feet on the road. I sprinted away from the bus, adrenaline fueling me onwards. I didn't look back, I just kept running. At the speed I traveled, I think it only took me a few minutes to reach the warm and welcoming lights of civilization. I looked at my phone and I, I cried when I saw that I had service. I booked a taxi. I, uh, I wanted the furthest possible destination. I chose Manchester and then I, I took the first train to London. For the past couple of weeks, I've been living in a hotel. I know I was a little late, but I finally took the advice of the online stranger, and I, I moved away. I moved far away. I don't go outside at night. And I definitely don't look out the window after 3 a.m. Thomas Jones was enjoying his second cup of coffee that morning, when the door to the work cabin was suddenly flung open and a fat, florid man by the name of Pendleton marched into the room. What in all the blue blazes is going on here? He said, casting a baleful eye at Thomas and the rest of his crew. We're nearly a week over schedule. You bunch of happy assholes are sitting on your butts drinking coffee. Now wait a damn minute, Thomas said, climbing to his feet. Thomas was a big man and loomed over Pendleton. Still, he felt small at the look of the righteous anger on the other man's face. Maybe we could talk about this outside, he said, glancing around the room. It was obvious the other man was going to tear a strip out of him, but he'd rather not have it done in front of his crew. Pendleton smirked. Sure, let's talk, he said, 
turning his back on him and strutting arrogantly from the room. Asshole, someone muttered under their breath. But Thomas ignored them and followed after the other man, closing the door gently behind him. As soon as the door swung shut, he turned on him. You want to tell me what the hell's going on here, Jones? This demolition job was supposed to be finished last week. Then I had a call from head office telling me to get my ass down to Cornwall. No explanation, just that things had come to a screeching halt with the job barely even started. Thomas took umbrage at that. Who the hell did this guy think he was, anyway, with his ill-fitting suit and superior attitude, coming down here and embarrassing Thomas in front of his crew? Does it look like it's hardly begun? He growled to the other man, widening his arms as if to encompass the entire street with its now empty plots. We'd been busy busting our asses to hit your outrageous deadline, and everything was going according to plan until we came to that monstrosity, he said, pointing to the end of the street, at the old manor house that stood grimly overlooking the sea. Pendleton followed his gaze. I don't see a problem, he smirked. That place looks like a harsh wind could blow it down. Thomas sighed and rubbed his head, beginning to feel the first pulses of a migraine. Look, it's hard to explain, so... I'll just have to show you, okay? Pendleton shrugged, uncertain now, and not sure what the other man was getting at. Thomas took his silence for consent and walked a little ways down the street before jumping into a nearby dumpster and firing up the engine in a cloud of black diesel-smelling fumes. Watch this! Thomas yelled over the roar of the engines, driving slowly towards the old waiting mansion. Pendleton followed on foot, careful not to get any of the black smoke on his shiny suit. When Thomas came to the mansion, he did a skillful turn, so he was now facing the grounds. The hanging gates thrown open as if in some kind of dreadful welcome. You ready? he said, looking down at the other man. What is this, show and tell? Pendleton yelled back at him. Just get the hell on with it, Jones. Time is money. Thomas nodded and drove slowly forward. As soon as the front tires hit the property boundary line, the dumpster's engine suddenly cut out. Thomas knew it was no good, turned the key, cranked the engine, but nothing. The big yellow dumpster ignition had just cranked over, but never catching until at last, gave up, throwing up his hands in frustration. You see what I mean now? He said, glaring down at Pendleton. You just flooded the goddamn engine is all. Get down from there, let me try it. I was driving these things when you were still playing with your Tonka trucks. Be my guest, Thomas said, jumping down and smirking as the fat man struggled to climb into the torn leather seat. Okay, baby, Pendleton muttered. Give it up for daddy. He slowly pumped the gas before turning the key, but no matter how he cursed and cudgeled, the engine simply wouldn't catch. Now put the gear shift into reverse, Thomas called up to him. Try her again. You lost your fucking mind, Pendleton snapped. The engine's dead, faulty equipment, that's all. Humor me, Thomas smiled up at him. Muttering, the other man did as he was bid, grinding the gears into reverse before turning the key. Immediately, the engine roared into life and Pendleton let out a cry as he was flung backwards before slamming on the brakes. What the hell? Pendleton cursed angrily, slamming the gear forward. The big machine approached the house again in angry jerks, but as soon as the front wheels hit the threshold, the engine immediately cut out. Furious now, he grabbed for the gear stick again, but Thomas jumped aboard and covered the other man's hand with his own. It won't work, Pendleton, no matter how hard you try. Pendleton angrily shook free. Go get that JCB from across the street, he pointed. But Thomas shook his head wearily. We've already tried. We've tried with every machine we have. The result is always the same. Bullshit! Pendleton snapped. You're playing some kind of prank or silly game up here. Are you shitting me? Thomas snapped back, his own anger growing. You think I would risk the jobs of my men, hell, even my own job, by playing some stupid prank on a, on a suit from corporate? You watch your tone with me, Jones, the fat man said, pushing him aside and laboriously climbing back down onto the street. Thomas followed, landing nimbly beside him. Fine, I won't waste my time trying to convince you then. The keys to everything we have are hanging up in the cabin. You go to town and report back when you're finished, Thomas said, strolling angrily away. This time it was Pendleton's time to follow. 
You're serious, aren't you? He said, laying a sweaty hand on Thomas's shoulder and gently turning him back around to face him. I ain't fucking with you, if that's what you're saying. No, nothing. I mean, nothing works. I have had every machine we have examined, checked for faults. They all run fine until we try to... You know, he said, looking towards the slumped house solemnly. How could that be? Pendleton replied, some of the anger fading as he followed the other man's gaze. Some say the old place is haunted, Thomas chuckled nervously. But Pendleton waved that away. Yeah, 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 we all heard those old wives' tales about Lucas Van Draven and the missing people, blah, 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 bullshit. And how do you account for all this? Thomas said, his headache worsening. I don't know, Pendleton said, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. Some kind of uh, magnetic pulse, or maybe l ley lines, or some kind of other crap, but I don't know. I do know one thing. Certainly ain't ghosts. In fact, he said, slowly walking away, I'm going to go take a look inside, see if I can't figure this thing out. You coming? You are the foreman, after all. Thomas didn't really want to go. If he was being honest, he didn't like that old house. It had a feeling about it, like something was trying to weasel its way into your mind, and stand in its shadow. It was akin to being buried alive. Still, he heard the challenge in the other man's voice. He didn't believe in ghosts and ghouls and wasn't about to let this corporate asshole show him up. Fine. Go take a look if that's what you really want. Together, the two men headed back down the street, their shadows growing long behind them. The Van Draven House stood as it had for almost 200 years, overlooking the dark waters of the Atlantic Ocean. It was a lonely place, abandoned and spurned by the locals of the village and surrounding areas who had grown up listening to the ghastly tales of Lucas Van Draven, who had murdered his wife and servants. But dark rituals and things left best unspoken, found in the spider-infested bowels of that old house not to mention the people from outside who had tried to renovate the old place. Many had gone missing or turned up dead. Madness, murder, and suicide had soaked into the very fabric of the Van Draven house, its dark legacy haunting the area with an unimaginable dread. So, what do you think? Thomas said as they stood on the threshold. Looks like a real shithole, Pendleton replied, taking in the overground gardens and peeling paint. As lions, he said, heading towards the entrance of the house before squatting down and tearing away the crawling ivy from the two statues. That's some kind of coat of arms? Thomas asked, almost going to his haunches, interested now despite his initial fear. Looks like it, Pendleton replied running his blunt fingers over the engraving, which was faint but still clearly showing a clipper ship riding atop a huge wave, some kind of bird soaring overhead, a struggling fish caught up in its great talons. Chiseled underneath, in stark relief, was one word. Van Draven. Charming, Pendleton muttered, standing and wiping the mud and leaves from his trouser leg. All right, let's take a look inside. I already tried that. The old place is locked. Unless you want to crawl through that, he said, pointing to one of the many shattered windows where jagged glass shined wickedly in the fading light. No need, Pendleton replied loftily. I just so happen to have the key, he said, reaching into his jacket pocket and pulling out a large bunch of keys attached to a metal ring. How the hell did you get those? When one buys a property, or in this case a whole street, one gets everything that comes with it, including the keys, not that they come cheap. The parish council asked an absurd amount for a place already half abandoned and falling into disrepair. The entire street was almost completely empty, and those who remained were easily bought off. Apparently they weren't fond of living too close to this old relic, he said, slapping one of the faded pillars. Thomas winced at that. Pendleton laughed at the look on his face. Don't worry, Jones, it won't bite you, he said, 
slapping one meaty hand against the old house again, but suddenly he hissed in pain, the palm of his hand bleeding. God damn it, he said, picking a piece of masonry from his hand. Fucking place should have been condemned years ago. Here, Thomas said, handing him a grease-stained bandana from his coverall pocket. Thanks, the other man replied, looking for a clean spot before quickly wrapping up the still bleeding wound. Look, maybe you should go clean that up. We, we can always come back tomorrow and didn't I tell you time is money, Jones, he said, selecting a large black pitted key and ramming it home into the lock. Let's go take a look before it gets too dark. I doubt very much the electricity is still on in this place. Fine. Lead the way. Not sure what you're hoping to find, but it's your party. Pendleton ignored that, and together, the two men stepped inside. The Van Draven house had once been a magnificent mansion built for his new bride. Lucas Van Draven had spared no expense. The once varnished floorboards had gleamed underfoot, illuminated by crystal chandeliers imported from Paris, France. The sturdy walls had been covered in fine, velvet-like wallpaper, and the house had been filled with all manner of antiques and wonders from Lucas's many travels abroad. But that had been many years ago. Now those same floorboards were warped and covered in grit and dust from the crumbling walls. The once massive chandelier that warmly illuminated the main entrance lay dark and broken, the many cracked crystals hanging like the fallen tears of those who had succumbed to the madness within. Jesus, Pendleton said, wrinkling his nose. The damn place stinks. What the hell is that smell? Mold, damp, decay, Thomas replied. We're probably taking years off our lives by breathing the damn place in. Still, he wasn't convinced. There was another smell that seemed to lay just beneath. A dark, rotting smell that seemed to stick to the inside of your nose and slime the back of your throat. I can see why the locals think this place is haunted, Pendleton said, scraping his shiny shoe tip through the broken plaster and small pieces of splintered wood. Look there, Thomas said, heading through a nearby hanging door into what looked like it must have been a study or a small library. Look at this. Damn thing must be over a hundred years old, maybe more, he said, running his hand over the desk's varnished sides. Probably older, Pendleton said. Surprised it hasn't been removed. Not in bad condition. Well, not compared to the rest of the house. You think it belonged to him, this, um... Lucas Van Draven, fella? Pendleton shrugged. Who cares? Come on, let's take a look around. Suddenly, there was a crash from upstairs, and a door slammed somewhere in the back of the house. Both men stared at each other. The air around them suddenly plummeted, becoming frigid, and Thomas was sure he could see Pendleton's breath just before the other man bolted, heading straight for the front door. Thomas hot on his heels. For a moment, Thomas was sure they would find the door shut and locked tight against them, but it was just as they left it and both men bolted through, not stopping or slowing down until they reached the other side of the street. Both doubled over, breathing heavily. Oh, holy shit, what was that? Thomas gasped. Probably just the wind, Pendleton said. Either way, it scared the living hell out of me. You and me both. Thomas chuckled, feeling like a fool. Okay, okay. Pendleton straightened. I don't give a shit. If that place is haunted or not, it's coming down one way or another. I'm heading back to Manchester now tonight. I'll send you a crane with a wrecking ball attached. The damn thing won't even have a chance to get close to the property. We just extend the crane arm, swing away, and down that happy asshole comes. We have the paperwork and everything. It should be with you in a few days at the most. All right, Thomas agreed. Sounds like a plan. Sure, the boys would like a few days off to go check out the local girls. Sleeping in a metal cabin on a cot bed and working around the clock has made them a bit testy. A few drinks and a lark will do some good. Pendleton waved that away. Whatever, Jones. Just make sure the equipment arrives and you and your boys are ready to go. I want this shit taken care of ASAP. Remember, time is money, Thomas cut in. Yeah, I, I got it. Then there should be no problems then, should there? Pendleton called over his shoulder as he walked away. Thomas said nothing. 
His eyes had returned to the Van Draven house as he realized once again he had been swallowed by its shadow. Thomas had left the rest of his crew to their debauchery and walked through the night-shrouded village. It was winter in Mavagesi, and the summer people had once again left the denizens of the village to their own devices. Turning his collar against the cold and damp, he noticed a flickering through a nearby pub window and smiled, peering through the window at the roaring fire inside. His frigid breath pluming against the glass, the place looked quiet and cozy. He looked up at the creaking sign that gently blew in the night breeze. The sign read, The Lantern. Okay, he said. Just one more for the road than off to bed. That said, he stepped inside, happy for the warmth and the fire's comforting glow before sauntering over to the bar and ordering a pint and a whiskey chaser. Taking his drinks, he sat by the fire, wishing for the good old days when you could still smoke inside instead of having to freeze your butt off in the middle of the street like some fucking pariah. He had just taken the foam off his drink when a small pudgy man with round John Lennon glasses appeared out of nowhere. He had a drink in one hand and what looked like a file stuffed with papers tucked firmly under the other. Funny enough, the owlish looking man seemed somewhat familiar to Thomas, but couldn't quite place him. When the man didn't speak, Thomas sighed, frustrated by the interruption. Can I help you with something? He said, trying to hide the annoyance from his voice. As a matter of fact, you can, the man smiled, taking Thomas's words as an invitation to sit. You're working up on Beach Road, I believe, clearing out those old houses up there. When Thomas didn't reply, he carried on excitedly. Yes, you've torn them all down, but not the Van Draven house, he said, his voice dropping to a conspirator's whisper. Seems like you're having some problems with that machinery of yours. Suddenly, Thomas could place the man. You've been hanging around by the coastal path, haven't you, up by that old house? The other man shrugged. The public footpath, I'm not trespassing, he added quickly. That's right, you ain't trespassing, Thomas repeated. But spying on our progress, perhaps? The other man laughed, <laughs> more like taking a vested interest. Look, he said, suddenly growing somber. My name's Harry Unsworth, from the University of Falmouth. Let me buy you another drink. We can talk. Hell, I may even be able to help you figure out what's going on up there. I have become something of an expert on the Van Draven house over the years. Maybe give you a little history on the old place. It's cold outside. We have a nice roaring fire. One hell of a night for a ghost story. And no man likes to drink alone. Thomas smiled at this. Interested now, in spite of himself... Besides, the man had a certain open charm, and a free drink was a free drink after all. Okay, he said, smiling. Mine's a whiskey. A double, actually. A few moments later, Harry returned with the drinks, took off his jacket, and seated himself more comfortably across from Thomas, his coffee-stained file between them. This, he said, tapping the file, is years of research and history on the incidents and the happenings that have taken place inside that house. The last case being less than five years ago. And a bunch of bloggers went up there and tried to stay the night. They had a YouTube channel, all ghost seekers. Two of them were found dead inside. The other one burned up on the front lawn. Now, the local police called it a murder-suicide. Slammed the case closed, just like they do every time the Van Draven house takes another victim. Thomas took a long drink, then nervously wiped at his mouth. Talk like the damn place is alive or something. Unsworth shrugged. Maybe it is. What is it you said you do again at the university of yours? Thomas said, not liking the other man's reply. Unsworth laughed. I'm a history teacher. You could say uh, parapsychology is a sideline of mine. No, I'm not crazy. That house has a checkered past. Here. He said, not waiting for a reply, but opening his file. The house was first built by Lucas Van Draven in 1836, on the hilltop overlooking the village. There was some controversy over the location, as a certain set of stone rings, going all the way back into antiquity, had been uprooted, and the stone used in the very foundation of the house. 
Then there were the two men killed whilst the house was under construction. One fell from scaffolding, another crushed by falling masonry. Lucas paid off the grieving widows, moved right in with his wife, Elizabeth, her maid, Matilda, and Lucas's manservant, Stevens. By November of the next year, all were found dead, except Lucas, who threw himself from the cliffside. A rumor has it, he was found with some abomination that still clung to him, even in death. There was also talk of dark rituals, obscene rites that were held to some infernal god in the dark bowels of that place. Jesus, Thomas replied, taking a long hard pull from his pint and wishing desperately for a cigarette. Oh, that's only the tip of the iceberg, Unsworth continued eagerly. The house lay abandoned for nearly 70 years until a retired shipbuilder from Manchester moved in with his dreams of renovations. <laughs> he was found some time later, hanging from the rafters of what had once been Lucas Van Draven's study. Now it was the turn of the Jonas family who went missing, their belongings still inside, but the family itself gone, just like that. He snapped his fingers for emphasis. Thirty years later, the Dorchesters found in the basement, their bodies found torn, twisted, as if by some terrible force. Now for a time, the house lay empty, holding its dark secrets until 2010, when the Maloneys moved in. A husband and wife, two little girls. A father was found in the basement, his family chopped to little pieces, scattered around him. The local constable that went to investigate was later found hanging from the ceiling beams in an upstairs bedroom. Then, there was the two town drunks who tried to break into Lucas Van Draven's tomb. <laughs> Perhaps looking for treasure. One was never seen again, the other, a raving lunatic. <laughs> I could go on. Please don't, Thomas said, holding up a restraining hand, which seemed to tremble ever so slightly. I get the point. I could see why many believe the place is cursed or haunted, but I'm a practical kind of guy, and I just don't believe in ghosts and ghoulies. What? The other man asked incredulously. How do you explain all the mysterious deaths and your machines? The hell do you think's going on in there? Thomas shrugged, throwing tired of the whole thing. I have no idea. But I doubt very much the ghost of Lucas Van Draven is fucking with me and my fuel lines. Unsworth didn't reply, but finished up his drink before leaning against the table towards the other man. In a way, it's good you don't believe. I have to admit, I didn't run into you tonight by chance. I have, shall we say, a proposition for you. Sorry, Thomas smirked, <laughs> but uh, you're not my type. Unsworth ignored that. I want to go into that house. I have certain equipment with me. I, I want to go inside only briefly, you understand, just to take a few readings and perhaps do a little recording. Thomas's eyes narrowed. So, that's it. You want me to get you inside, and why would you want to go in there? You so obviously believe the place is cursed or haunted or whatever the hell it is. You believe. So why? You know, why would you want to go in there? <laughs> because, Unsworth replied, just happy that Thomas hadn't walked out on him yet. Because if, if I can prove it, if I can get a good reading or catch something on camera, I can finally get the university to take me seriously. Maybe even give me funding to study the paranormal right there on campus. Well, I hate to rain on your parade, Thomas said, starting to stand, but I ain't going to be helping you break into that old house. It's more than my job is worth. A thousand pound cash, Hemsworth said, slapping a stuffed envelope onto the table between them. A thousand pounds right now, just for ten minutes, to just take a walk around and take a couple of readings. Thomas slowly sat back down. You're crazy, he said, eyeing the stuffed envelope. Look, Unsworth said, your crew are all down here pissing it up, chasing the village girls, and locals don't go anywhere near the place. Nobody will see us, and you're up a grand, tax-free, for ten minutes of your time. Seeing Thomas needed a little more convincing, he reached into his pocket again and slapped another stuffed envelope on the table. It's another thousand. Don't ask for more. I'm tapped out. Jesus, you're crazy, Thomas said. 
Still, he reached across the table and stuffed both envelopes quickly into his jacket pocket. Ten minutes, he said as both men climbed to their feet. You have ten minutes, and you're done. Sure, sure, Unsworth said, scrambling into his jacket. And don't worry, what could possibly go wrong? It had taken Unsworth ten minutes to nip back into his B&B and gather up his equipment. After that, both men had headed up the hill, neither talking much. Thomas smoking one cigarette after another. He knew he was doing a stupid thing, but too grand was too grand, and the chances of being caught inside was little to none. Still, he didn't cherish the thought of going back into that old place, especially after the horror story he had been subjected to. Even if you didn't believe in all that supernatural crap, it was enough to give you the goddamn heebie-jeebies. However, it wasn't every day you got to earn two grand for ten minutes. He was dragged out of his own pondering by an excited squeal from Unsworth, and looked up surprised to see that they had already arrived. Okay, okay, Unsworth said, quickly crossing the road and unzipping his jacket, revealing an expensive-looking camera that hung around his neck. Just a quick snap from the outside, and we can head on in. Thomas looked nervously about as the camera's flash cut through the surrounding darkness. Hurry the hell up, will ya? he hissed. Okay, okay, let's go. Unsworth said, trotting back against the street, his camera banging hollowly against his chest. The hell am I doing? Thomas muttered under his breath as he led the way, pushing past the rust-covered gates into the Van Draven grounds. The smaller man hot on his heels. Suddenly, he was blinded by another flash as Unsworth snapped another photo of the crumbling lions that proudly held the coat of arms of Van Draven. Cut that shit out! He angrily rounded on the other man. You take one more fucking picture before we can get inside, and the whole goddamn thing is off. Sure, sure thing, Unsworth said, quickly stuffing his camera away. Still, he buzzed with an excited energy that set Thomas's teeth on edge. Okay, Thomas said, we're going in through the back door. The thing is all rotted out. It should only take a quick shove and we're in. After that, you got ten minutes, not a second longer. Understood? The other man nodded eagerly. Let's go. The back of the Van Draven house was much like the front, overgrown with clingy ivy. The once marvel flagstaffs covered with centuries of fallen leaves. The wind whistled through the rotting eaves, and long dead trees creaked and groaned in the stark winter winds, as if horrified to be trapped in such a hellish landscape. From behind them came a sudden loud boom, and both men spun around, their hearts beating hard in their chests, it was only the lid of an old coal bin banging up and down in the growing wind. <laughs> Jesus. Endsworth laughed nervously. This place is one crazy creep show. You could say that again, Thomas replied, his wet tongue sliding over his dry lips. You sure you want to go in there? Yes, Unsworth replied. You're goddamn right I do. I've been waiting for something like this all my life. I wouldn't be stopped now just because of a stiff breeze. The little man's courage bolstered some of Thomas's own. All right, then, let's get it done, he said, approaching the sagging back door and laying his shoulder against it gently before pushing hard with his legs. Immediately, the rotting door gave way. Thomas let out a cry of alarm. Unsworth's quick reaction stopped him from taking a nasty fall as the other man grabbed a handful of his jacket. Thanks, Thomas said. That was easier than expected. I guess the house wants us to come in. The comment was supposed to be a throwaway remark. Yet it hung heavily between the two men until Unsworth took a flashlight from the inside of his jacket and gently pushed past, illuminating the interior within. They were standing in a large kitchen, or what was left of one at least. In the middle of the room sat a large wooden chopping block, splintered and gouged. Attached to a nearby wall was a large rusting sink, from which fat droplets of filth-colored water dripped onto its chipped, sagging surface. Broken tiles crunched beneath their feet, and shelves with old, bulging, rusty tins cast deranged shadows across the peeling walls. Thomas swallowed hard and glanced at his watch. Ten minutes. Ten minutes, and we're out of here. Unsworth didn't answer, but moved more fully into the room, snapping the occasional picture, his flashlight illuminating the decay and stark relief. 
When he was done, he pushed through the sagging door and into a long hallway. Thomas stayed close behind him. It's cold, Hunsworth muttered. You feel that? He sat over his shoulder. Yeah, Thomas replied. What do you expect? It's the middle of winter. Unsworth didn't reply, but took a thermometer from a small bag he was carrying and quickly recorded the temperature. We need to go that way, he said, pointing to the end of the hall. That's Lucas Van Draven's study. If anything's going to happen, it will be in there. I doubt it, Thomas sighed. Still, he was eager to leave the place. There was something in the air, a kind of watchfulness. He quickly glanced at his watch. Eight minutes. Unsworth turned and continued down the hall, his flashlight cutting through the waiting darkness until at last he reached the study room. With its ornate desk and rotting books that perfumed the air with the smell of rot and mildew, Unsworth stepped inside. Thomas was about to follow when a sudden hiss came from behind. With a cry, he swung around, flashlight trembling. Just then, the door between the men slammed shut. From the other side came a cry of alarm as Unsworth pounded on the door, frantically trying to get out. Thomas stood there frozen as a naked woman stepped out of the darkness. Two knitting needles sticking obscenely from her throat, blood oozing down her body. In her outstretched arms, she carried some kind of obscene creature that mewled and thrashed as if in terrible pain, its own rancid blood running down her arms. Through bloody teeth, she grinned at him. Oh, Lucas, she groaned. Oh, Lucas, what have you done? What have you done to our son? With an angry hiss, she flung the abomination at him, and with a cry, he threw up his arms, staggering backwards, landing heavily against the front door with a screech of fear. He tried to beat the creature away, but there was nothing there. The woman had completely vanished, and the house was deathly silent. Quickly, he scrambled to his feet. Remembering Unsworth, he grabbed for the study door, which opened easily to his touch. What he saw there almost broke his mind, and he took a step away, whimpering. Unsworth lay across the large, ornate desk. Two old-fashioned quill pens had been driven into his eyes, and his throat was a bloody ruin. From beside his body, a little girl's face suddenly appeared. She grinned at him slyly from her bloody mouth. Hey, mister, she giggled. You see my sissy? She's around here someplace. A cold hand suddenly fell against his shoulder, and with a scream he turned and looked into the rotting face of Lucas Van Draven. In his terror, he forgot the little girl and staggered back into the room. You should not have come. Lucas groaned, maggots squirming in his hair. This place is damned. We are damned. We're trapped here. This place feeds upon our souls. It will feed upon you, too. You will spend an eternity of torment trapped in this place. No! Lucas cried, swinging his arms at the rotting corpse. But his hand passed through the thin air, and he ran, heading for the front door. But of course, finding it locked. This way, lover. A voice called from down the hall. A pale, bloody arm broke through the darkness, beckoning to him. The nails cracked and bloody. With a cry, he headed up the old winding staircase. Desperate to escape the madness below, his mind started to fracture as the house came alive all around him. He could hear screams and gibbering. Faces appeared out of the darkness, their faces infused with torment and terror. With a cry, he flung himself into the first room he came to and slammed the door closed behind him. Inside, there was nothing but an old, rusting cot and a large, ornate wardrobe that now creaked open. It won't do any good to run away. A child's voice seeped from within. I hid right here. Right here, and Daddy found me. Always. The door slowly creaked open, and a dead boy staggered out. His eyes rolled white, his skin slate gray. A large carving knife jutted from his chest. His bloody Thomas the Tank Engine pajamas clung to his wasted body as he slouched his way towards Thomas. 
You should stay a while. <laughs> he giggled. It's so beautifully dark here. The door he had escaped through was shaking now, and he could hear screams of anguish as dark, rotting blood seeped towards him. With a scream of madness, he flung himself against the room and hit the boarded-up window, which instantly gave under his weight, and blessingly, he was falling. Splinters of wood and shards of glass all about him, as he turned and twisted in midair, he didn't see the rusting fence spikes that burst through his back and chest, impaling him like a bug on a needle. The last thing Thomas Jones saw, as the light faded from his eyes, it was a multitude of faces. The windows of the house were filled with them, their hungry, grasping hands beckoning him to join them. Inside the Van Draven house, time did not stand still. It twisted and undulated. Heavy footsteps echoed down the hallways, a scream of despair, followed by breaking glass drifted from the kitchen. Somewhere in the bowels of the house, a child cried out in fear and a woman's moans and sighs drifted down the peeling halls. In the parlor, a grandfather clock chimed softly, as it had done for many years, and would continue to do so for many more. And for now, the evil inside slept, and the house waited and waited and waited. I wasn't too surprised when we matched. In my bio, I mentioned that I worked as a kennel tech, which a specific job of caring for the puppies sold by the store. And in her bio, the topmost point was that Potential dates must get along well with dogs. <laughs> As an icebreaker, I asked her what was the weirdest or most eccentric thing about her, and her response wasn't too weird. So I chalked it up as, ha, aren't I so quirky kind of thing. Um, she said, I don't let my dogs around other dogs when we're out on walks because I'm kind of afraid he'll give away house secrets. <laughs> so my response was, compared to hers, Fairly tame. I told her I can't walk by a door that is open or even barely ajar without closing it. Now, she didn't criticize my compulsion. And although she didn't share it, she sympathized with the overall idea of being annoyed or frustrated by things that are left unfinished. Only a few messages later, I decided to shoot my shot, and I asked her out. Now, there's a bookstore not far from my house, so I offered to buy her a cup of coffee and a snack... And she enthusiastically accepted, with the only caveat being that we wear masks. Now, I had no issue with this. The bookstore required it anyway. Thirty minutes later, we were sitting across from each other, chatting, and in my case, sipping coffee. <laughs> I bought her one as well, but she merely kept her hand wrapped around it for warmth, saying she'd drink it later, when it wasn't so hot. I figured that despite her willingness to meet up, she was still a bit hesitant to unmask herself around a stranger, which was absolutely fine, you know, with me. I showed her the pictures of the puppies that I take care of at work, allowing her to swipe through the images to her convenience, which I thought was a good way to help her relax, considering that most guys would probably print out pictures from their phone rather than pass it over, uh, you know, if they could. So she smiled, laughed, and uh, she asked questions, having a preference for shepherds and huskies generally gave the impression that she was enjoying herself. Well, after about an hour, um, when the cup was empty and hers had yet to be touched, she got up and said that she was ready to go. Thinking the date was over, I thanked her for her time, prepared to browse some books, happy that I had at least gotten a pleasant conversation out of the meeting. But uh, as I pushed away from the table, she put her hand on mine and said, The masks stay on during sex. Twenty minutes later, she was leading me into her apartment. We crossed the foyer in a small living room where a dosh hound sat on the couch in front of the TV. I'd often leave the TV on for my Bichon, but rarely did he pay as much attention as it did the dosh hound seemed to be. The little guy was lying back on the couch with his little legs slumped against his belly, a half-chewed treat on the couch beside him. As we crossed in front of the TV, his little head followed us, but not even a questioning bark escaped his mouth. 
and my date merely waved at him as she led me towards the bedroom. Given the importance she'd placed on dogs in her profile and the glee she'd shown when looking at the pictures I'd taken, I expected her room to be obsessively decorated in all things dog, but it was a fairly normal millennial woman's bedroom. She pointed towards the bed with an air of dominance that she hadn't before expressed and nudged the bedroom door with her foot, almost closing it. Once she noticed my slight cringe that I honestly tried to hide, she shut the door completely and apologized. Then climbed into bed beside me. I brushed it off as nothing, even as I fought the urge to go check to make sure that it had been closed all the way. A few moments later, we were undressing. All clothing, except for masks, of course, tossed haphazardly around the room. Her curtains were closed, blocking out the diminishing sunlight, but there were purple and pink Christmas lights strung up along the walls for the purpose of establishing what I can only imagine as she called a chill vibe. It was a picture of her dosh hound that saved me. On a bedside table was a picture of the aforementioned pup, sitting in her lap outside what looked to be a cabin somewhere. But the contents of the picture aren't important, it's what dimly reflected by the glass that caught my eye. Just as she wrapped her arms around me, right before the act had begun, I saw her closet door reflected in the glass. The closet door was ajar. I turned away, my horniness immediately overridden by the neurotic impulse, the ajar closet door like a fire that I had to put out. Just as this happened, my elbow inadvertently brushed against or maybe collided with her head. Despite the previous overpowering sensation, I'm not an asshole. I immediately turned back to make sure she was all right, and I saw that it had knocked her mask off, and immediately began a litany of apologies, but abruptly stopped halfway through the third, I'm so sorry. Because I finally got a look at what was beneath the mask. The area of her face she'd been so adamant about concealing. It wasn't a normal mouth. It wasn't even a disfigured one. Hell, I would have been fine with a toothless, gummy grin, a third nostril nose, maybe even one of those freaky yet kind of enticing forked tongues. Anything, so long as it was identifiably human. This girl. This girl I'd spent most of the day with. This girl with whom I was only seconds, mere inches away from having sex with had instead had the diminutive snout of a dog beneath her mask. She screamed, or rather yelped, but not from an unintentional elbow blow. She'd recovered just fine from that and was hastily trying to refasten her mask around her face. I scrambled away and fell off the bed, terrified beyond sense. Somehow, perhaps through a subconsciously driven automation of body, I crawled backwards and happened to shut the closet door, but there was no relief from this action with the hound woman only a few feet away. She had remained on the bed and only addressed the issue of her dog face when she'd finally gotten her mask back on. She beckoned me to return to the bed, saying that the snout was a birth defect, some some sort of ultra-rare yet harmless genetic anomaly, and yet, as she said this, her dog mouth slavered hungrily, creating a truly abhorrent visage of cross-species mania. Total bullshit. Not believing any of it, I darted around the room in search of my clothes, but only managed to find my t-shirt and pants before the bedroom door opened and the dosh hound walked in. Hey, Sarah, I heard you shout. This guy hurt you? The Dawshan looked at me, eyes heavily lidded with body language that bore without question the subtle posture of a slightly alarmed human being. Sure, he was on all fours, yet despite his quadrupant stance, there was an inexpressible humanity in the way he stood. I screamed like a madman when he spoke again, this time saying, Hey, buddy, what'd you do? With the dexterity that I'm surprised was possible giving flight of terror, I leapt over him, landed in the hall beyond the door, and kicked it shut behind me without halting or significantly altering my stride. Before I had even entered the living room, I heard vicious barking issue from within the closed bedroom, and now that I'm reflecting back on the experience, I'm absolutely certain the savage sounds had been made by two different voices. I've made it out of there with a fragment of my sanity. 
would have escaped that warped mongrel nightmare without having any need to attend therapy sessions after therapy session if I hadn't noticed the slightly ajar door in the kitchen. My nerves warred with me, those wired for survival screaming at me to leave and those born of compulsive neurosis arguing, hey, we can't leave that door open, can we? I'm sure you can guess which side won out. The kitchen was only a few feet away, so I, I jumped over the coffee table and another two steps I was at the door. But before I could close it, before I could finally put an end to that utterly insane day, inside of this domain of the dog people, I saw something ascending the stairs. I automatically opened the doors. Anyone would have automatically done for someone below them in that situation, but I wish with all of my heart that I hadn't. Because the person coming up the stairs wasn't a person like I was. I mean, they walked upright, sure. They climbed the steps in typical human bipedal fashion. But they were entirely nude. Covered in short, brown fur, their head. Oh god, their loathsome head. It was the reverse of my dates. Rather than the top half of their face being human, theirs was canine with a human mouth in place of a snout. The floppy ears of the dog perked up in an expression of slight surprise, while a human mouth sipped a drink through a straw. Our eyes met, and without showing any real shock at my entirely human appearance, the bestial stranger said, Oh, you must be the new guy. Has she let you pick out your collar yet? With a force that might have been a bit excessive, I slammed the door in their face. I heard a splash, presumably, some of the drink falling to the floor as they recoiled away in surprise, and only a moment later I heard the deeply unsettling sounds of a tongue lapping up the liquid that had landed on the wooden stairs. I turned around and fled, but made one final frightful observation before bolting out of the house. On a rack beside the front door were six collars, all with names. All of the names were mailed. My date, apparently, was the owner of the brood. I had only met two of the four dogs. I refuse to imagine in what state of anthropomorphic de-evolution or grotesquerie canine mutations the other four were in. Obviously, I unmatched her on the dating app once I'd driven a comfortable distance away. You can only speculate about what might have happened to me if I'd had sex with her. Perhaps, perhaps she would have placed some sort of transformative spell on me mid-act, or maybe the mere act of having sex would have initiated the usurpation of my humanity. I don't know. I have no intention of finding out by going back to that site of zoological abominations. The only good thing to come from the dreadful experience was the total erasure of my compulsion. I mean, I have no problem with doors being left open now that I've developed a maddening fear of dogs. Including my own cute, fluffy, and entirely innocent pup. Who was asleep in front of the TV when I returned home. Fall is finally here, and it's finally cooling down, which means it's time for you guys to get yourself a hot cup of tea. My wife happens to sell tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea sells different teas that are inspired by nerdy based things, as well as a bunch of new teas that are available for the Halloween season. My personal favorite, and the one that I drink whenever I'm recording, is Dark and Stormy Night. It has a little Mr. Creepy Pasta symbol on it, and if you ask, you can get a little Mr. Creepy Pasta dabbing sticker. Also, anytime that you order one of those, you actually get my autograph on a little card, so if you want that, hey, you can get that. And finally, I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Krause, Disciple, Strategy Wolf Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone Pandemonium. Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Corbin Dallas, Estabine, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sasaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams. I picked up the phone, and to my absolute horror, I discovered it was my mom on the other end of the line. Now, don't get me wrong. 
It wasn't like I hated my mom or something, but God rest her soul, that lady was the very definition of passive-aggressive. She brushed aside my attempts at small talk and asked, Why don't you call us every now and then? You never call home anymore. I started to say that's not true, but she cut me off, manufacturing a dry, raspy cough. When she was done with her imaginary coughing fit, she said, I don't know what's wrong, but I've, I've been coughing a lot. Maybe I have something, I don't know. You know, cancer runs in the family, right? Your Uncle Raymond had cancer. I muttered, Uncle Raymond smoked two packs a day and looked anxiously at the clock on the wall. I had to get going as soon as possible. Time was ticking away. Sure, go ahead and dismiss what I'm saying, Mom responded in a pouty tone, and she coughed again for emphasis. Everyone's always dismissing me around here. Your father, your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, all of them. They never listen to a word I say. I told your father, if this cough gets any worse, I want you to take me to a doctor. And you know what he said to me? Nothing. He just turned up the TV a little more and went back to his newspaper. I grunted, Mom, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. She made an outraged sound in her throat and snapped. When did you become a doctor, hmm? When did that happen? You must be pretty good if you can diagnose me over the phone. They closed my eyes and groaned. Will you give it a rest? Stop making yourself cough before you actually hurt yourself, okay? Look, I gotta go. I got this, uh, this thing I need to do for work. You know how it is. I'll call you on Monday, okay? Say hi to Dad for me. I have no idea what you do for work these days, she said coldly. Seems like everything is a big mystery with you anymore. Now, before you go, I should tell you that the police came here to ask some questions about you. I froze for a moment, and Mom patiently waited for my response. I swallowed hard and croaked. What kind of questions? They were very personal questions, she muttered in a disapproving tone. I just shrugged and told them, I don't know what to say, everything's a big mystery these days, he almost never calls. That's what I told them. Faintly, I mumbled, right, okay, that's, yeah, okay. Thanks for letting me know. There were a few seconds of silence as she waited for further clarification. When she realized I wasn't going to elaborate, she angrily cleared her throat and demanded, Well, why were these two homicide detectives asking me questions about you? Did you kill somebody? Did you see someone get killed? Good gravy, what the heck is going on with you? I stammered, Nothing. Nothing's going on, Mom. I didn't kill anyone, nor did I see anyone get killed. I saw nothing, and I know nothing. I have no idea why they showed up at your door. Swear to God. She grumbled, you swear to God, kids these days don't even believe in God. You all listen to that music and smoke your drugs. Now tell me the truth, kiddo. Did you kill someone? Did you kill a prostitute? I slapped my free hand against the wall and choked. Why would you assume it was a prostitute, Mom? Holy shit. Is that what you think of me? Well, everything's a mystery with you anymore. She shot back. You're so secretive, and you never have a girlfriend. I think it's very strange that you don't go on any dates with girls. I shouted, that's because I'm awkward, not because I want to kill them. I, I can't believe you. I mean, you could have just assumed I'm gay or something, but no, you, you went straight to me being a freaking serial killer? She shot back. Don't yell at your mother. I'm not the one who has the police on their trail. Oh, I should also remind you, it's your Aunt Glenda's birthday on Sunday. Did you get her a card? I shook my head and muttered, I've literally never given Aunt Glenda a birthday card. She lives on the other side of the country. I've only met her three times in my entire life, and she also thinks I'm someone else. That's no excuse. I'm pretty sure they have mailboxes on the other side of the country. You better get her a card or you won't be in her will. I grunted, damn, I was hoping she'd leave me her collection of fine china. Easy come, easy go. Speaking of which, I gotta go now. Work stuff and all that jazz. Talk to you Monday. Bye. I hung up the phone and resisted the urge to give it a slap. I'd been hoping the cops had given up on squeezing me for information about Vincent. But I should have known better. I briefly considered calling Vinny the Pomp. But I decided it would have to wait. I had a more pressing matter at hand. I had to find Kaz. I needed his guidance. And I needed it immediately. I'd never been to the zoo on a weekend before. The first thing I noticed was how dark and foreboding the garden seemed behind the towering fence. The second thing I noticed was that the gate was locked. I couldn't get in. Couldn't buzz for assistance either. 
If I used the intercom, the security goons would know I was there. I put my head in my hands and moaned, Why is it locked? Why? It was 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning and the zoo was closed. Of course it was locked. How did I not foresee this? For God's sake, how? Shit. Fuck. God damn it. I sat there in my idling car and considered my options. I'd been hoping I'd be able to sneak into a building without being seen, but I couldn't even get past the freaking gate. Bingo, bango, my half-baked plans were already dead in the water. I smoked a cigarette in the dark. It still tasted really bad to me, but at least I wasn't getting lightheaded anymore. I lit another one and tried to think of another way around this particular roadblock. I needed to find Kaz, but I had no idea where to look. The only way to find him was to convince Miss Dahlia to give me his address and phone number, which might prove to be a difficult task all by itself. After all, the caretakers weren't supposed to talk to each other outside of work. It was expressly forbidden. There were two major barriers between me and Miss Dahlia. One barrier was the presence of two or three heavily armed dickheads who might be wandering around the zoo. The other was a literal barrier, a 20-foot wall of reinforced steel. And even if I managed to get past both of those formidable objects, I would still have another problem waiting for me. A very large and angry problem called Lenny the Barber. After the stun I pulled to get him out of my hair, there was no doubt that Len was going to be furious with me. But that was a concern for later. I had many life-threatening scenarios ahead of me before I had to face that particular hornet's nest. According to Zoo Protocol, one guard was supposed to be monitoring the video cameras at all times, but I knew from working the midnights that they rarely paid attention to the cameras. They almost never patrolled the grounds. They spent most of the nights taking turns sleeping in a broom closet. Now, don't get me wrong, I can understand their lax attitude. I mean, what was going to happen? Was the thief going to break in and steal the fucking goblin? If someone actually managed to get into one of the habitats, they'd probably be murdered on the spot. I rubbed my palms against my ears and told myself... Figure out how to get past the gate first. One problem at a time, man. I couldn't get in by myself, so... Was there anyone who could help me? Sprites? Very doubtful. They seemed like they were all about law and order, and I was trying my best to commit trespassing. If not the sprites, who could possibly help? A light bulb went off in my head. I tossed a stone against the fence and called out, Clara, can you hear me? Over here! I held my breath and waited. Within a few moments, I heard a faint scratching against the other side of the gate. It sounded like claws. I knelt down beside the fence and said, I need to get inside, but the gate's locked. It's really important. Can you help me, Clara? I, I don't have much time. I held my breath and waited to see what would happen next. But then a minute or two, a circular patch of earth started to crumble inward on my side of the fence. Two fuzzy antlers emerged from the hole, along with a pair of long ears, a twitching nose and a wide fan of whiskers. Clara blinked in the glare of my headlights, and then she disappeared back into the hole. I shot off my engine, grabbed a flashlight out of the glove box, and crawled into the hole. It was actually a tunnel. It was just exactly wide enough for me to worm my way to the other side. The tunnel sloped downward beneath the buried portion of the fence, and rose back up to exit a few feet from the other side. I suddenly realized the jackalope could escape the zoo at any time that she felt like it. She was only there because she chose to stay. For Clara, the zoo wasn't a prison. It was a home. She greeted me at the top of the tunnel by licking my nose and poking me in the eye with her antler. I muttered, Ow! and gave her a vigorous petting. I whispered, You're the best bunny rabbit in the whole world. You're freaking the greatest. She followed along as I furtively stole my way across the gardens. I skirted the main entrance and let myself into a service tunnel through one of the exit doors. I found myself standing in the aviary wing, and all was dark and quiet as a tomb. I tiptoed down the corridor like a cat burglar and punched in the code for the pneumatic door, wincing as the deadbolts drew back with a series of bangs and clanks. I had no idea what I would say if I got caught by a security guard, I mean, even if I could convince him I wasn't doing anything wrong, it would still get back to Vic, and Vic would definitely want to know why I was there. I just couldn't get caught, that's all. It simply wasn't in the equation. I stuck close to the wall in the main lobby, trying my best to be invisible. It was gloomy in there, and the silence was thick. When I made it to the door that led to the reception area, I breathed out a long, deep sigh of relief. Everything was going according to plan. 
I opened the door and walked right into one of Victor's security thugs. He had one of Vic's cigars clenched in his teeth, and three more were sticking out of his jacket pocket. We stared at each other in shock for a moment. Then he grabbed the front of my jacket and growled, Looky here. It's new guy, Bobby Dipshit or whatever. I squeaked, Billy Whitebread. And he responded by shaking me like a baby rattle. He said, I don't give a shit about your name. What I do care about is why you're here. I tried to push his hands away, and I sputtered, I got Vic's permission. He said it was okay if I came back tonight. I had to... My mind went blank. Why did I need to come back? I opened my stupid mouth and blurted out, I had to get some stuff out of my locker. The guard snapped. First of all, Vic would have let us know if you were coming. No one shows up here unannounced, not ever. Second, your locker ain't in the reception area. He shoved me back into the lobby, and my mind seized up with an overload of panic. I was fucked. I was completely and utterly fucked. As the security guard was manhandling me into the lobby, a streak of brown suddenly came blazing in from out of nowhere. It slammed into the goon like a cannonball. Wham! The impact made him slide 15 feet across the floor. I let out a strangled cry of surprise and shock. I could scarcely believe it, but my rescuer was Clara. She hopped over to stand on his chest and aggressively sniff at his unconscious face. She must have snuck in behind me when I slipped in through the exit door. When she was satisfied the guard was no longer a threat, she hopped over and leaned against my leg. I looked down at her with my mouth hanging open and whispered, Holy hell, did you just kill that guy? From behind me, Miss Dahlia called out, You better hope not. That young fellow is Victor's nephew. I poked my head through the doorway and saw her standing beside the waterfall. The water had been shut off for the weekend, and the pool was dark and still. She looked sleepy and irritable in a frumpy nightgown. She saw the puzzled expression on my face and scowled at me. What did you expect? She demanded. It's the middle of the night. Stop gawking at me and drag him over here. I can save him. At first, I thought she was being a little dramatic. I mean, the guard didn't look that bad. But then I saw a pool of blood oozing from the back of his head. I groaned. Oh, fuck me. I started dragging him by the ankles into the reception area. I was already huffing and wheezing by the time I pulled him past the threshold. The guy was built like a refrigerator. Miss Dahlia said, bring him over to the pool, hurry up. I can hear his heartbeat fading. I gasped, yeah, mine isn't doing so good either. You maybe give me a hand, please? He's a really big guy. The water nymph gave me a sour look and rolled up the sleeves of her nightgown. She grabbed him by one leg and effortlessly dragged him over to the side of the pool. She dripped a palmful of water across his face, and as the droplets rolled down his cheeks, she softly sang to him in a dialect that was probably older than humankind. Her voice was entrancing. It made me feel at peace. The thug focused his eyes on her face. He touched the back of his head and croaked, Why am I on the floor? You had an accident, she murmured in a soft voice. You slipped on the floor and fell. You should be more careful next time. He blinked up at her with a dazed expression and mumbled, I slipped and fell. Gotta be more careful next time. That's right, she agreed. Now go find a mop bucket. He made a mess on the floor. Uncle Victor won't like that, the guard said faintly, and he heaved himself to his feet. He looked over at me and asked, Who's that? Why's that rabbit got antlers? That's nonsense, Miss Dahlia said firmly. Rabbits with antlers? Absolutely not. There's nothing there. He looked away from us and muttered, Nothing's there. Hey, where'd all that blood come from? He started to look confused again. Miss Dahlia prompted, You slipped and hit your hat. He snapped his fingers and exclaimed, All right. Damn, look at all that blood. Head wounds bleed like a bitch. Miss Dahlia sighed. You're fine, sugar. And she pushed him into the lobby. She closed the door behind him and whirled around to confront me, her dark eyes smoldering with irritation. She growled, Why are you here? You have absolutely no business being at the zoo tonight, and that goes double for being here in the reception area. This happens to be my living quarters. Did you know that? I literally sleep in that water, you intrusive idiot. You better have a damn good excuse, or I swear to each and every god in the heavens, I'll grab you by that skinny neck and beat that stupid out of you. I gawked at her with my mouth hanging open, and I was suddenly very afraid. There was no doubt in my mind that Miss Dahlia could easily pound the living shit out of me. She had dragged the security goon across the floor like he was made out of feathers. I mean, she was a supernatural being that slept in a pool of river water. Of course she could beat me up. 
I looked down on the floor and mumbled, I I'm really, really sorry. Long story short, I need Casimir's address, his phone number too, if he has one. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't have a phone. He's, you know, it's kind of weird like that. What for? She demanded. Must I remind you, it's against the rules. Y'all can't speak to each other outside of the zoo, sugar. Victor doesn't like it. I gave her a pleading look and said, I just really need to talk to him, okay? Believe me, I wouldn't break into the zoo at night for a laugh. I am 100% scared shitless of Vic, and I, I would absolutely not risk making him angry if I didn't have to. So please, please, just do me this one favor, please. No. Now go away before I punch you in the liver. I took a deep breath and held my arms away from my body. Go ahead then, I wheezed. Do it. Miss Dahlia gave me a considering look. Grudgingly, she answered, I already saved your narrow butt once tonight. You and that mangy rabbit, neither one of you should be here. As for Kaz, well, he's still on the mend from getting attacked by that ape. He needs rest. I gave her an indignant look and sputtered, Here he's not an ape. Okay, he's not an orangutan, he's not a freaking gorilla, he's a sasquatch. How would you like it if I called you like a, like a pond fairy or something? You wouldn't like that. Miss Dahlia rolled her eyes and shot back. He's a smelly, flea-bitten ape, and you're a foolish little mouse with a death wish. Now get out of here! I'm tired. I threw my hands up and hollered, I'm in a tough spot over here, lady, okay? Just give me his address and I'll leave. I, I won't ever come back to the reception area again, I swear. Miss Dahlia patted me on the shoulder and said in a husky voice, Well, now let's not be hasty. She walked behind her desk and dug around in a filing cabinet. She called over her shoulder. If it's advice you're looking for, you should go talk to the skinwalker. He's always tripping into the spirit realm. The spirits can tell you anything you need to know. I perked up a little and asked, Does the succubus hang out in the spirit world by any chance? Miss Dahlia gave me a scornful look. She huffed, that shameless floozy. She's got it all hanging out across every plane of existence. She's a demon. They aren't bound by time and space. The water nymph glared up at the ceiling and yelled, I hope you heard that, you nasty old floozy. I hope you choke on a neutron star. I flinched a little and cautiously asked, I don't mean to pry, but why do you hate her so much? Miss Dahlia's eyes became distant. She wrote Kaz's address down in the back of an envelope and muttered, Many, many ages ago, she destroyed someone near and dear to my heart. A water nymph doesn't forget. And we never forgive. She handed me the envelope, and there was an awkward pause. I cleared my throat and said, Okay, I guess I'm off to pay Falling Sky a visit. Thanks again, Miss Dahlia. Sorry to bother you. She looked me in the eye and softly said, Men only come round when they want something, don't they? Well, good luck, Billy. Don't be a stranger. She reached into the pool and touched her fingertips to the water. As they made contact with the surface, she transformed into a woman-shaped column of liquid, and she flowed into the pool. This happened in a split second, there and gone in the blink of an eye. I leaned over the edge and saw a brief impression of a body beneath the surface, and then I was staring at a murky reflection of my own face. Vic's nephew came bursting in with a mop and bucket. He started to mop up drops and spatters of his own blood, grumbling curses under his breath as he worked. He didn't seem to notice my presence. Claire and I tiptoed around him, and we headed for the skinwalker's habitat. It was located in a special wing of the zoo, a ghoul-proof addition that had silver and lead poured into the concrete. It was designed for the undead and the never-living. It was known as the Other Wing. I was about to embark on the journey of a lifetime. I was about to trip into the spirit world. Falling Sky was sitting by the bonfire outside his Hogan. He called us over with a grin, and he greeted the jackalope like an old friend. This one. She's very special, he told me. I'm glad to see her again. Been many hundreds of years since we last met. I gave them both a surprised look and asked, How'd you meet? Falling Sky lit his pipe and said, 
I was living as a rattlesnake in those days. Came out to bask in the sun one morning, and I was snatched up by an eagle. I was already in the air before I knew what was happening. Couldn't change back. We'd both fall to the ground. The eagle took me to her nest, and when she landed, I turned into a bear. I killed her with one swipe of my paw. So you see, the eagle soars high and far, but the bear will always come out the victor. I waited for more, but Falling Sky just sat there and nodded at me in a wise manner, squinting through a haze of pipe tobacco. Finally, I asked, so where does Clara come into this story? Solemnly, he said, oh, I met her some time after that, I think it was on a Thursday. Just saying, a bear will always defeat an eagle, they're too big. I saw the glassy sheen in his eyes and asked, You're blasted right now, aren't you? I walk among the stars. He grinned, and he made wiggling motions with his fingers. Poof, jingle, jangle. In the sky they dangle. Right, okay. Um, I'm just thinking that maybe I could, uh, I could, like, try some of that tea with you. Is that, that okay? Falling Sky slapped his hands together and rubbed them like a supervillain. He cackled, I would be honored to be your guide. How far do you wish to go? I gave him an uncertain look and shrugged at him. I don't know, I answered. All the way, I guess. I want to visit the spirit world. His gaze grew somber. He asked, are you sure? Such a journey, it changes people. Not always for the better. I gave him an unhappy look and said, I'm not sure, no, but I feel like I don't have much of a choice. I need to talk to the succubus. Falling Sky looked alarmed. He held up a hand and shushed me, his eyes darting around in all directions. He whispered, She is a monster that is feared by other monsters. The spirits can be frightening enough on their own. Why would you wish to come face to face with the Eater of Souls? It complicated. Look, just give me the tea, all right? I have to do this. Slowly, he said, You're either very brave or very stupid. Either way, I'll be your guide. Drink this and brace yourself for what is to come. Tea was very hot in the tin mug, and it tasted incredibly fucking bad. I'd never tasted anything so bitter and strange in my whole entire life. I struggled not to gag on the first swallow. Falling Sky urged me to drink it all down in one go. I steeled myself against the taste, and I got it all down. It was fucking horrible. I cried out in anguish and struggled not to puke into the desert sand. Falling Sky handed me a wooden bowl filled with honey, and I poured a big, sticky mouthful of it directly down my throat. I gasped, oh my god, I almost started to cry. It tasted that friggin' bad. It was just... Oh boy, it was bad. I gagged again and sobbed. Oh my... Oh God, fuck. <laughs> Shit. Clara looked very concerned. She tried to nuzzle my face, and she almost knocked me off my log with her antlers. I gently pushed her down and said, No thanks. I don't even get poked in the eye right now. Yeah, the skinwalker mused. I guess it is pretty horrible, isn't it? I suppose I could use some sugar or something. I've been drinking it for hundreds of years, so I don't really notice anymore. Should have plugged my nose, I wheezed, and I wiped tears from my eyes. I added, I took a <coughs> big risk coming here. I should have been killed at least twice already. Should I prepare myself for a third time? At least once more, yes, he agreed. But that's the thrill of the trip. Eagle versus bear, my young friend. Which will you become? I muttered, it doesn't matter. I'm already dying over here. <coughs> I felt as nauseous as I've ever been in my life. I tried to control my breathing, and I focused all my will on not throwing up the tea. Choose, the skinwalker urged, as he leaned forward on his log. His eyes were darting around in their sockets at random, and he was smiling like a lunatic. I spat into the dirt, quavered, I'd use machine gun. I'd, I'd blast both the motherfuckers and be done with it. How's that? Good gravy. This tea is the worst drink 
in the whole fucking world. Falling Sky gave me a deeply offended look. Sarcastically, he said, Ha ha, that's very funny. Are you mocking the ritual, you pasty water seagull dropping? Hmm? Better not be mocking the ritual, my friend. This is my heritage. I snorted. Come on, being a skinwalker is not part of your heritage. Your people disapprove of that kind of thing, don't they? Not like your parents set you off to Navajo witch school to get a degree in shapeshifting. A dumb thing to say. Well, you're certainly in a mood, aren't you? Falling Sky grumbled. It's not my fault you can't handle a little mug of tea. You even started crying. Don't deny it, I saw you. You're a whimpering little cry monkey. I gave him a sharp look and demanded, The hell's a cry monkey? You mean a cry baby? Yeah. Maybe I cried a little, but at least I never spent any time living as a snake. Let me tell you something, man. It's fucking weird slithering around in the sand and just, like, eating mice and lizards and, you know, fucking scorpions and shit. Fucking why, man? That's just weird. He gave me an unconcerned shrug and said, Variety is the spice of life, little brother. I can see your mind is closed, but it will be open soon. Look down at your hand and tell me what you see. I looked at my hand and said, I just see my hand. I don't think it's kicking in yet. He patiently replied, Wrong. Look again. I still just see a hand? Look, I'm sorry. I was being crusty with you, man. It's been a long day. I hopped to my ears and... Uh, uh, what the fuck? Holy shit! Right in the middle of my sentence, the structure of my hand became jarringly different. There were no longer five-fingered flesh pods I was used to seeing at the ends of my arms. Instead, I was looking at a couple of scaly, four-toed monstrosities. My hands were now eagle claws. I was in complete shock. My legs were gone. In fact, almost my entire body was gone. I had feathers, wings, and a curved beak. I was no longer a man, I was an eagle, perched on top of a log, and the other log was now being straddled by an enormous grizzly bear. I looked over at Clara, a scream rising in my throat, but she gave me a completely unconcerned glance, and went back to nosing around the habitat. Falling Sky said apologetically, It was either eagle or bear, and I prefer to be the bear. Are you ready to ascend? I croaked, I don't know, and gave my wings an experimental flap. I mean, I guess so. He chuckled. Your body doesn't ascend, only your heart. You don't actually become an eagle. You're just really high right now. I looked down at my eagle body in confusion and stammered, What about you? Are you just, are you really a bear right now? He patted his chest with an enormous paw and said, Yeah, I turned into a bear. I didn't have to, but I like to get into character. Let's go. We sat there and stared at each other for a bit, and nothing happened. At least it seemed like nothing was happening. But then I noticed that my log was no longer touching the ground. The habitat was gone. No bonfire, no Hogan, no Clara. No walls, just empty space all around us. The air was filled with dreary gray mist. We could have been floating 10,000 feet in the air, or we could have been sinking 10,000 feet below the surface. It was impossible to tell. I looked over at the bear and asked, Is this the spirit world? He shrugged his massive sloping shoulders and said, Yeah, probably. I never really know when I've arrived. It's always different. As he was talking, a large form appeared in the background. It resolved itself as one of the ghost deer that haunted the gardens outside the building. It was a doe. She trotted across the nothing and leaned down to nuzzle me. I told Falling Sky, I guess we're here. This deer is a ghost, after all. He patted the deer's flank with his paw and answered, Yes, I suppose so. I thought we might be lost, but we're definitely in the spirit world. You see, there is the world we live in, and then there is the spirit world. I believe there are many places beyond the spirit world, but that is not for us to know. I scratched the doe behind the ears with my beak and whispered, I need to talk to the succubus. Go fetch the succubus. Go! Falling Sky gave me a stern look as the ghost deer wandered away. He said, You don't want that, Billy Whitebread. Talk to my ancestors instead. They will have the wisdom of ten thousand years. I threw my wings in the air and yelled, I don't need to know about the migration patterns of the buffalo, my man. 
I've got a very specific problem over here, okay? If Vic gets to the succubus before I do, I'm probably fucked. I have to get to her and strike a deal. Hey, don't shake your head at me like that. This bullshit is completely beyond my control. Believe me, I'd rather be watching the tube and scarfing a cheeseburger right now. Well, I suppose she can't eat you over on this side, Falling Sky mused. But she can still scare the shit out of you. You're way too high to deal with that right now. I don't think you should face her until your mind is clear. I grumbled. Wish I could put it off, but I don't have much time. Come Monday, I might already be shit out of luck. A handful of solemn-faced Navajo people came silently walking into view. Falling Sky whispered, It's the ancestors. As they drew closer, he greeted them all by name. He pointed at me and asked, Do you have any wisdom to share with my friend? A tall, solemn-faced man drifted over and quietly said, On the night of the seventh full moon, you must gather your hunting party along the banks of the great river. You will need twenty brave hunters, each of them burdened with as many arrows as they can carry. Make camp before dark arises, shortly after the moon sets. As the sun begins to glow in the sky, you will feel the herd approaching through the vibrations in the ground. I turned to Falling Sky and groaned, You see... This is what I was talking about. These guys don't know how to help me, man. They've been dead for way too long. No, no, I, I was just kidding. The Navajo spirit chuckled. Just fucking with you, little brother. My, my advice is to find the sex demon and strike a bargain with her. There's, there's no other way if you want to live. I felt my wings droop at my sides in disappointment. I groaned. But I don't want to kill anyone. She'll want to sacrifice in exchange for a favor. I, I can't live with that kind of shit riding around on my back. Fuck. I wish I was talking to Kaz right now. He'd know what to do. The spirit gave me a guarded look and said, Casimir can't help you. See for yourself. The mist parted like a curtain, and I found myself looking into the living room of a small apartment. Casimir was stretched out on an old couch. He was wearing a grubby-looking tracksuit, and one of his socks was missing. The coffee table beside him was a mostly empty bottle of vodka stood behind an overflowing ashtray. Kaz held something against his temple. I heard a muffled click. I saw that he was holding a revolver, and my heart lurched in my chest. I sputtered, what the, what the hell is he doing? The spirit gravely shook his head, he murmured. He does this sometimes when he's drinking at night. He loads one bullet, spins the chamber, and he pulls the trigger. I squawked, what? What? And started hopping around on the log in agitation. Casimir gave the revolver a despondent look and dropped onto the floor beside the couch. He rolled over and buried his face in his arms. The spirit waved his arm and said, As you can see, Casimir is in no position to help you right now. Can't even help himself. The mist rolled across the clearing, and our interior view of Casimir's living room disappeared. I felt a lump forming in my throat. I croaked. Oh, shit. Obviously not doing so good. Yeah, okay. I see. I won't bother him then. I'll just have to go talk to the succubus and deal with it myself. Thanks, man. I appreciate your insight. The spirit crossed his arms and said, Well, spirits are rich with insight, but we're very short on cash. Please consider making a donation. I gaped at him in disbelief and asked, how, how do I donate money to spirits and where would you even spend it? I'm fucking with you again. He chuckled. Go and find your demon, Billy Whitebread. Be wary of her tricks and the pleasure she offers you, or you risk being destroyed. One of the other Navajo spirits called out in the background, but what a way to go, and made vigorous thrusting motions in the air. The rest of them started giggling and nudging each other. Don't listen to him. He muttered in a surly voice. Some spirits think it's funny to mess with the living. From their point of view, it's not a big deal if you die. Anyway, I wish you luck, little brother. Come visit us again sometime. I appreciate speaking with the living every now and then. Makes me grateful for how easy it is to be dead. He gave me a little pat on my eagle head and faded into the mist. The others, still giggling and making off-color jokes as they followed behind, I looked over at Falling Sky and said, Well, I guess it's time to face the music. How do I find her? Falling Sky pointed to the fog and said, Just walk that way until you see her. 
In the spirit world, anything you want can be found in any direction. By the way, you're puking your guts out right now. I realized I was crouched on my hands and knees in the cold, gritty sand beside the log, and yeah, I was retching my guts out. A terrible way to snap back into reality, that's for damn sure. When it was over, Falling Sky handed me a rough piece of linen to wipe my mouth. I gasped. You don't have a pack of gum laying around, do you? My mouth tastes like toxic waste. He raised an eyebrow and asked, Do you see a variety store in here? Is there a supermarket tucked in that corner? Here, rinse your mouth. He handed me a tin mug of warm water. I spat it onto the sand and sighed, Okay, I think I'm ready. I looked around the habitat and promptly closed my eyes. Everything around me was swaying and rippling, including the ground beneath my feet. It was a nightmare landscape of blurred edges and intense color. I could barely make any sense of my surroundings. I mumbled, holy shit, boss, I'm fucking wrecked over here. How long is this going to last? He advised, don't worry about what you see, Billy Whitebread. Don't think, just feel. Move in the spaces between here and there and ride the waves. Now, I frankly didn't have a clue what he was talking about, but his face was melting and it was freaking me out. I just nodded my head and told him, it's time for me to go. Wish me luck. Falling Sky gave me a slanted smile and said, Luck is all we have in the world of the living. Wisdom only comes from death. Good luck, Billy Whitebread. I headed for the exit, carefully, placing one foot in front of the other, and I whispered to myself, Move in the spaces. Ride the waves. With every step that I took, it became more apparent that this was easier said than done. The spaces were moving all over the fucking place, and the waves were making me sway around like I was suffering from a brain injury. I, I suppose I, I was suffering from a brain injury, in a way, but it was chemical rather than physical. The urge to puke my guts out hit me again when I got to the door. I had to close my eyes for a while and lean against the wall until the nausea passed. When I opened them again, all I could see was white. No walls, no floor, no lines or dimensions at all. Just a blank void of white in all directions. I called out the Falling Sky in a panic. But he was gone. Or was it me who was gone? There was no way to tell for sure. I stumbled around and yelled my stupid head off into the featureless and merciless void, panic twisting my chest like a knife. Where the hell was I? And how would I ever get back? Was this it? Was this going to be my new state of affairs forever? I slowly became aware that soft music was shimmering from the empty air around me. It was a classical piano piece, a moody and somber composition in a minor key. A figure materialized in the distance and began to approach with a sultry sway of its hips. As the figure drew closer, I realized that was my 10th grade French teacher, Miss Florence. Fifteen-year-old me had developed a secret lust for Miss Florence early in the year. She always wore her hair in a severe-looking bun. She had a different color of horn-rimmed glasses for every day of the week. She also possessed a pair of bowling ball-sized gazongas that strained against her dress jacket with alarming force. I often daydreamed about them in class, my eyes glazing over as she droned away in the front of the room. I rubbed my eyes in disbelief and stammered... Miss Florence? Miss Florence, is that you? Are you, uh... Are you dead? She gave me a warm, inviting smile and stepped even closer. She purred, Am I dead? Not even close. You've certainly grown since you were in my French class, haven't you? You're a handsome young man now. She reached out to trail a finger down my chest and I nervously stepped away from her touch. I squeaked, What are you doing here? Are you real? Miss Florence raised an eyebrow and softly asked, Do you want to find out? She slowly undid the top button of her dress jacket. The next one. And then another. My former French teacher wasn't wearing a shirt underneath, and her cleavage was everything I'd ever dreamed it would be. My hand floated up from my side to reach for her. I snatched it back with the other one. I shook my finger at her and snapped, oh, you're, you're not Miss Florence. You're, you're the succubus, aren't you? She put her hands on her hips and pouted. Well, I think just about every woman is a succubus at heart, Billy. That's what you like to be called now, isn't it? Billy Whitebread. What a whimsical name. 
Do you remember anything I taught you back then, Mr. Billy? Hmm? Come here. I want to give you a pop quiz. Miss Florence let out a giggle and pointed at my crotch. Despite my fear and a head full of psychedelic tea, I still managed to pitch a pretty decent tent. I covered it with my hands and circled around from her. She followed after me and crooned, Don't be shy. Come here and let me make everything better. I stomped my foot on the nothingness beneath me and yelled, I know you're really the succubus, so stop it. I don't want you to eat my soul, okay? It's not worth it. She curled her lips and demanded, How would you know? Thousands of men have sacrificed their very existence to the pleasures of my embrace. Do you think you're above that? Look, I'm the most awkward guy you've ever met, I croaked. Believe me, I'm not above it. I'm actually very way, way below it. <clears throat> Stop trying to trap me for a second and hear me out. I want to cut a deal. She gave me a smile and shrugged her shoulders, making Miss Florence's bosom rise and fall in a hypnotic fashion. Perhaps. What is it? If Victor comes to you and starts asking about Vince, can you tell him you don't know anything about it? Maybe just, you know, make up a lie or whatever. She gave me a predatory leer and asked, And what do you offer in return? I faintly muttered, Can you just do me a favor this one time? I'll owe you one. You know what I mean? The succubus gave me a scornful look. She growled. I long for flesh beneath my teeth, not broken promises. Give me someone to feast on, or I'll tell Victor the truth. I rubbed my temples and groaned. Come on, lady. Give me a fucking break, which uh, I'm trying my best over here, you know? I'm trying to do right and be a good person. She narrowed her eyes and hissed. I'm not a charity, young man. I'm a demon from beyond time and space. Look around you. Where do you think you are, Disneyland? I felt tears sting my eyes. In a broken whisper, I asked, What if I let you drink some of my blood? I mean, not all of it, just some of it, you know, just a, a little bit. Her eyes blazed a terrifying shade of purple. She leaned closer and breathed, Lay with me, and then allow me to eat one of your arms. I croaked, No, I, I need my arms. I'll, uh, I'll lay with you, sure. And then you can have, like, a half a pint of my blood? She countered. Give me a full pint of your blood. In a thick, greedy tone that made a shiver run down my spine. I shook my head and told her, Only half a pint or no deal. The succubus moaned. Oh, you're such a defiant little duckling, aren't you? It's a deal. Now come to me. The next ten minutes were a wild ride, to say the least. I didn't have a lot of experience before this event, so all I could say is... Holy shit, I was not expecting any of that. The succubus started as Miss Florence, but she kept fluidly transforming into different people in rapid succession. She became the moody-looking goth girl who worked at the Pizza Hut down the street, then Molly Ringwald, then some random actress from an old Spearmint commercial. She finished as Miss Dahlia panting with exertion as her dangling hair brushed against my face. When it was over, she stared into my eyes and muttered, And now for dessert. Her mouth slammed into my shoulder, and needle-sharp teeth ripped into my flesh. I tried to scream, but she clamped her other hand over my mouth and held me down. There was nothing I could do but lie there and whimper as she sucked at the wound. When she was done, she lifted her head and licked blood off of my skin with a tongue like serpent. Her eyes were dark as slate, Fathomless, completely blank. I felt like I gazed into those eyes and never stopped falling. The succubus traced her fingers across the puncture in my shoulder, and they closed up without a trace. She licked the rest of the blood away and whispered, There, good as no. Oh, don't look at me like that. Just a quick little sting, and then you're fine, see? Not a single mark left behind. Anyway, I'm bored of you. Put your clothes on and go back to reality. She stood there and looked me up and down with a contemptuous smile as I got dressed. She still looked like Miss Dahlia, and that somehow made me feel even more ashamed. The succubus held up her hand and said, When I snap my fingers, you'll wake up in your bed, safe and sound. 
I hesitated and asked, So, we're good? Y you won't tell Vic about anything about the, you know, about the, the Vincent situation? Oh, I'll take care of it, she assured me. Now get out of my sight, you little worm. You have skinny legs and your blood is sour. Get some more vegetables in your diet. She snapped her fingers, and the next instant, I was looking up at the ceiling of my bedroom. I was in my own bed, wearing pajamas, and felt well-rested. I also wasn't high anymore, which was really awesome news. I didn't want to feel like that ever again. I was officially done with drugs once and for all. I asked the ceiling. Was that a dream? And for a moment, I genuinely didn't know the answer. I let my eyelids slide shut, and then turned over to go back to sleep. I started to drift off, but I was abruptly snapped awake by the faint squeak of my front door swinging open. My first thought was, oh shit, it's Len. I slid out of my bed and listened for a minute. It was quiet, but I knew he was out there, standing in my living room with his eyes locked on my bedroom door. I steeled myself for a shitstorm that was a about to erupt, and I called out, Is that you, Len? Really sorry, man. I mean, honestly, but I... I did what I had to, you know, just let me, let me explain, okay? The door burst open, and I gaped at my intruder in shock. It wasn't Len, after all. It was one of the homicide detectives who brought me down to the station. We looked at each other for a moment, and then I demanded, What the hell are you doing in my house? He put his finger up to his lips in a shushing gesture and said, you can't tell anyone I was here, kid. I need your help. I stared at him, not understanding, and then I asked, Are you okay, officer? Shit, man. Is, is anybody okay? What the hell's happening out there? He gave me a puzzled look and shook his head. I don't know about any of that, kid. But me? Personally? I'm in dire need of your help. Get dressed. I'm gonna take you for a ride. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I want to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video. I want to give a huge thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. This past year has been rough. I've been gone for quite a while trying to get things um, organized for my own life, and Patreon subscribers, you guys who subscribe everywhere, th this, this has kept me afloat in turbulent waters. So I want to give a very special thank you to Jordan Humble, Diana Kraus, Disciple, Strategy, Wolf, Emoji, Sully Man, Brandon Mendoza, Brimstone, Pandemonium, Kaltuna, William Wellington, Scruffy the Janitor, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Jenna, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Verbal Horror, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Mike, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Gordon Dallas, Estebean, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Cryolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Dirt Diver 030, Voice of Sand, Psychomel, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Sashi Sazaku, Croconut 509, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all you guys and everybody who's included in the description down below, thank you so much for everything that you guys have done for me, and thank you so much for being here when times get difficult and I can't always be around to make content. I really appreciate your support, and I cannot thank you enough. And that goes to everybody who watches these videos, that goes to everybody who's subbed here, and anybody who has <laughs> ever liked a creepypasta story ever. I wish you all the best. Sweet dreams.